Like all nations, Kenya has been founded on the efforts of many people, institutions, organizations, corporations and professions. One of the foundations upon which the nation has been built is the banking profession and the banks and institutions through which that profession is practiced. Banking in Kenya has contributed tremendously to the growth of the national economy and the well-being of millions of Kenyans since before the country's independence on December 12, 1963. The history of banking in Kenya traces its roots to early European trade on the East African coast, chiefly Zanzibar, in the later part of the 19th century. In 1887, Sir William McKinnon, with the endorsement of the British Foreign Office, set up what later came to be known as the Imperial British East Africa Company, IBEAC. The formation of the IBEAC captured the attention of the National Bank of India, NBI, which entered into agreement with the East African representatives of the merchant company, Smith Mackenzie and Company, to act as its banking agent on the East African coast. In those formative years, NBI fortunes in East Africa were inexplicably linked to the fortunes of IBEAC, which was an independent corporate entity with its own flag, currency, postage stamps, private army and offices in Mombasa. IBEAC was wound up in March 1895 and replaced by the East Africa Protectorate, a system of administration that involved more direct British government control through the Foreign Office. Perhaps encouraged by the turn of events, NBI established its first branch in Mombasa the following year. In the same year, the East Africa Protectorate started building a railway line to Kisumu. NBI was appointed the official banker for the venture, marking the beginning of the bank's long and handsomely profitable relationship with what later became the colonial government of Kenya. The railway finally arrived at Kisumu in 1901 and helped to open up the hinterland for business. The fastest growing inland center was Nairobi, which had been established in 1899 as a camp for the railway crew. In 1904, NBI set up its first East African hinterland branch in Nairobi. The bank's business would grow as development in Nairobi grew. With economic growth in the protectorate, more banks were attracted to the country, necessitating the government to pass the first banking ordinance in 1910 to regulate their operations. In January 1911, the Standard Bank of South Africa opened two branches in Kenya, one in Mombasa and the other on Delamere Avenue in Nairobi. The National Bank of South Africa came in 1916. In 1920, the East Africa Protectorate was declared a colony of the British Empire and its name changed to Kenya. The new colonial status helped the three banks grow rapidly, mainly through increased deposits from European and Asian customers. But banking services were not available to Africans. The only source of banking services for Africans was the Post Office Savings Bank, which started in 1910 as a department within the Colonial Postal Service. Even then, the service was only available in places where officials of the Colonial Postal Service were stationed and therefore did not reach the majority of Africans who resided in rural areas. In 1925, the National Bank of South Africa was merged with the Colonial Bank and the Anglo-Egyptian Bank to form Barclays Bank DCO, Dominion, Colonial and Overseas. Barclays took over the operations of the three branches of the National Bank of South Africa, then in existence in Kenya. Despite political upheavals such as World War II and the subsequent Mau Mau uprising, banking in Kenya experienced considerable growth. Between 1945 and 1960, Barclays Bank clerical staff grew from 283 
to 1,163. In 1951, the bank also completed construction of a modern building on Queensway Street, at the time the tallest building in East Africa, to house its main branch and head office in the colony. The steadily growing Kenyan economy would soon lead to an influx of new banks in the decade between 1950 and 1959. In 1951, the Dutch Bank, Algemeen Bank Netherland, NV, or General Bank of the Netherlands, opened a branch in Nairobi. It was followed by the Bank of India, which opened its first branch in Treasury Square in Mombasa on January 17, 1953, and the Bank of Baroda on December 4 of the same year, with its first branch also in Mombasa. Somewhere that connection between Baroda and Indians, Asians settled in Kenya was there already. And the Bank of Baroda being the bank in that area, it became a bank for those people coming from Africa to India. We opened in Mombasa, immediately within a year we opened the Nairobi branch. But once these two branches were settling down, we realized there are pockets of business areas like in Kisumu, like in Eldoret. But if you remember in 1960s, the communication lines were very bad. Uh, infrastructure was really not there. But how to serve those people in those places? Business was happening there. So Bank of Baroda found an innovative way, banking on wheels, which we today we call it a so mobile banking, which in 1960 was a very rarity. It happened that time. They were commuting to that city and taking the bank, doing the banking service there and putting the money in Nairobi. This was, in, even for Bank of Baroda, this was the first experiment banking on wheels in Kisumu and from Kisumu and Kenya it migrated to India where it became the most popular uh, service of today. The Pakistan-based Habib Bank, Overseas Limited, came in 1956 while the Ottoman Bank and Commercial Bank of Africa rounded off the rush by establishing branches in the country in 1958. After India attained her independence from Britain in 1947 and the subsequent hiving off of Pakistan, NBI changed its name in 1958 to National Overseas and Grindley's Bank later called National and Grindley's Bank, following its merger with Grindley's Bank, another London-based bank which traced its roots to Calcutta, India. By 1951, the banks had expanded their branches considerably, but employment opportunities for Africans in the banking industry took a long time to materialize. Indeed, it was not until June 1963, a few months before the country became independent, that the first African manager of a bank branch, Peter Nyakiamo, was appointed. Nyakiamo was appointed sub-branch manager at the Queensway branch of Barclays Bank, after working for the bank for more than 15 years. In fact, I joined the bank on 13 March 1947. The bank was being run by British, managerial, but the bank, people who really work with Asians. You could say that probably we had uh, six or seven Europeans in the branch, the majority Asians. So you had number one, Amzungo, number two, a nation, number three, an Arab. Number four, an Africa. The banks went in for Africans to encourage them to come and bring deposit. I'll give you an example. When I was in Bungoma, I could open an account with one shilling. I went around the societies and asked them to open an account with one shilling. The same thing when I was transferred to Kisi. My job was go around and get the societies and African farmers to open at least an account and with one shilling. So you have a ledger with 20 people, customers, but their balance is one, 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 one shilling. But that was the first step trying to introduce or to attract an African way of banking. 
By the time Kenya became independent, the currency used by the banks in Kenya, Uganda and Tanganyika was the East African shilling. This had not always been the case. Before currency was introduced in East Africa, trade was conducted by barter and later by cowrie shells and beads. The first currency to be used in the East Africa coastal region was the Maria Theresa Thala, a silver coin introduced to East Africa between 1800 and 1850. This was replaced by the Indian rupee following the coming of British trade to East Africa. In 1920 came the East African florin, introduced by the East African Currency Board, which had been set up in 1919. The florin was replaced by the East African shilling in 1922. The first Kenyan currency notes went into circulation in 1966, upon the establishment of the Central Bank of Kenya, three years after the country became independent. The bank issued the first Kenya coins on April 10, 1967. They were in denominations of 1 and 2 shillings and 5, 10, 25 and 50 cents. The central bank established accounts for all the commercial banks in Kenya. On November 16, 1966, the central bank took over the operations of the banker's clearing house. These were the first steps the central bank took towards controlling and regulating the activities of banks. The central bank's first governor was de Leon Baranski, who was seconded to the Kenyan government by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. In May 1967, Baranski was succeeded by Duncan Degwa, who, until then, had been the head of the country's public service in the government of the country's first president, Jomo Kenyatta. Ndegwa took over at the central bank a few months after the bank faced its first major challenge, following the Tanzanian government's nationalization of all commercial banks in the country and imposition of exchange control restrictions against Kenya and Uganda. The move meant that Kenyan commercial banks had no way of remitting funds or sending checks and bills for collection in Tanzania. This forced the central bank to set up emergency measures by which it became the channel for transacting business between Kenyan banks and the Bank of Tanzania. The commercial banks the central bank regulated were all foreign-owned, a situation that was part of the colonial heritage that the new government of independent Kenya was determined to change. The country's first fully locally owned commercial bank came on June 19, 1965, when the Cooperative Bank of Kenya was registered as a cooperative society, initially to serve the growing farming community. Co-op Bank, as it came to be known, commenced operations as a bank on January 10, 1968, with a start-up capital of only 255,000 Kenya shillings, supplemented by an interest-free loan from the government of 214,000 Kenya shillings, repayable in 10 years. The first fully government-owned bank, the National Bank of Kenya, was established on June 19, 1968, with John Michuki, then Treasury Permanent Secretary as Chairman of its Board of Directors. Two years later, Michuki was appointed Executive Chairman of the newly established Kenya Commercial Bank. His place at the National Bank of Kenya was taken over by Stanley Githunguri. The government set up Kenya Commercial Bank after buying a 60% stake in the National and Grindley's Bank and splitting the bank up into two banks the Kenya Commercial Bank and Grindley's Bank International, Kenya. KCB took over all but two of the branches previously operated by National and Grindley's Bank in Kenya. It was those two branches that constituted Grindley's Bank International, Kenya. Of the three newly established Kenyan banks, KCB quickly outpaced NBK and Co-op Bank mainly on account of having more capital and a substantially broader branch network.
In November 1976, the government assumed full ownership of KCB by buying out the 40% stake initially retained by Grindley's Bank of London. The formation of the government-owned banks had the desired effect of speeding up the provision of affordable banking services to the majority of the population. It also prompted foreign-owned banks to take measures to remain relevant in the Kenyan market and beyond. In 1969, Standard Bank of South Africa merged with the Chartered Bank of India, Australia and China to become the Standard Chartered Bank, Stanchart. On its part, Barclays shed the Dominion Colonial and Overseas DCO tag to become Barclays Bank International. A decade later, it was locally incorporated in Kenya as Barclays Bank of Kenya, with Samuel Waruhu as its first chairman, while T.D. Miles became the managing director. Barclays would later become the first bank in Kenya to offer its shares to the public, when in 1986 it floated 30% of its equity on the Nairobi Stock Exchange. The government and foreign-owned banks would not continue their virtual monopoly on banking for long. During the decade or so following the death of President Kenyatta in 1978 and his succession by his Vice President Daniel Arab Moy, seven new banks and 33 non-bank financial institutions came up to join the single private indigenous bank, Co-op Bank. The main characteristic of these new banks and financial institutions was that they were small in terms of startup capital. In 1980, the minimum capital required to establish a bank was 2 million shillings. That of non-banking financial institutions was half a million shillings. But as the new bank started experiencing cash flow and other problems, the central bank raised the requirements for startup capital. By 1982, it was 5 million Kenya shillings, and by the end of the decade, it had been increased to 15 million Kenya shillings. But by then, a number of the new locally owned banks were finding it difficult to keep afloat. Twelve banks collapsed between 1984 and 1989. This first wave of bank collapses forced the government to pass the Banking Act of 1989 which, among other things, tightened requirements for the licensing of new banks and non-banking financial institutions. The minimum capital requirement was substantially increased. Deposit insurance was made mandatory, and over-lending and earning interest on non-performing loans were prohibited. And to protect depositors and oversee bank liquidation, the government set up a Deposit Protection Fund Board. In December 1989, the government combined the deposits and assets of nine of the collapsed banks to form the Consolidated Bank of Kenya and mandated the new bank to undertake the task of reimbursing the deposit customers of the collapsed banks. Despite the government's new regulations, there would be a second wave of bank failures between 1993 and 1995, affecting 19 banks. Several of these collapsed banks had been indicted in the infamous Goldenberg scandal of the early 1990s, associated with businessman Kamlesh Patni. But the story of local privately owned banks has not been the story of bank failure after bank failure. Indeed, indigenous banks have carved out a niche for themselves not only by competing with the long-established banks for mainstream clients but by diversifying their customer base to include Kenyans in the low-income class and informal or Juakali sectors. Equity Bank, established as the Equity Building Society in 1984, stands out as the indigenous bank that has greatly tapped into this market to attain phenomenal success. The bank is the market leader in terms of account holders and innovative products and services targeting Kenyans in the lower middle and low income classes. 
the bank and its chief executive officer, Dr. James Mungi, have won numerous local and international awards in recognition of their performance. It is true the 80s, um, early 90s, was collateralized by massive failure of what was regarded as the indigenous uh, financial system or all banks. Uh, the biggest failure uh, came uh, to a great extent uh, uh, by mismanagement. As we said, the competences, the skills were not very resident uh, in the majority of the people. The conflict between ownership uh, and management, particularly in governance, was also a major cause. And the reason why we succeeded was uh, very strong governance structures from the onset. We separated ownership and management, and that helped us a lot. Uh, uh, I myself came as uh, a manager, uh, not uh, from, I was not uh, in the ownership structure. And that separation allowed us to really manage what we could say conflict. Uh, and agreed that was eminent that uh, when people saw money they assumed it was their money and not the depositors money and diversified their investment using insider borrowing so we were able to avoid uh, that curse. I remember when I joined uh, Equity we were number 66 out of 66 and uh, seeing today that we are the number one bank in number of customers profitability market capitalization in the country we have really grown. Other examples of banks targeting lower income and special customers are Jami Bora Bank and two fully-fledged Islamic banks, First Community Bank and Gulf African Bank. You know, the reason why we decided we wanted to be a bank, we were a microfinance institution and we had grown very big. Um, even though we started with 50 beggars and had not planned at all to grow big, we grew very big because the poor desperately need access to finance for their tiny tiny businesses that nobody thinks of as a real business and uh, when uh, the central bank was going to regulate microfinance institutions i was the vice chair of amfi the association of my microfinance institutions so i was very much involved in these negotiations we started saying that what they're asking us to do and to be is almost like being a bank so why don't we become a bank and we had also seen our members grow from extreme poverty and some of them grew very fast and they were now coming into big business now they they were above what we could do in microfinance and they would have to go to the bank but the bank they went to then didn't know their history didn't understand that somebody who had never finished even primary school could be doing such big things but we understood because we had seen them grow so we decided we must be a bank ourselves as they have grown to meet the demands of an expanding market kenyan banks have had to cope with a changing foreign exchange situation that has continued to pose a great challenge to their operations Following the international gold crisis of early 1968 and its resultant devaluation of the British sterling pound to which the Kenya shilling was pegged, the central bank and the Kenya government found it necessary to impose foreign exchange controls and import licensing. By 1976, the central bank issued a raft of measures aimed at conserving foreign exchange while improving the liquidity of commercial banks and other financial institutions. By the beginning of October 1982, partly due to the abortive coup attempt of August that year, Kenya was reeling under a major foreign exchange crisis. The country's foreign exchange reserves could only last between two to six weeks as opposed to the conventionally accepted minimum of three months. This forced the central bank to introduce even more restrictions on imports, thereby limiting companies from bringing in raw materials and spare parts essential to their operations. The result was widespread losses in the private sector and inevitable employee redundancies. And you can imagine, in those periods, all the countries in this region were exercising price control. The paradigm changed. 
that in the that's a you know remember structural adjustment yeah. structural adjustment um, policies by the world bank were actually and the and perhaps even the imf were actually saying let the market determine prices and then you are going to see investment flowing in sectors that are profitable okay that's why you, you realize if you want to if you want to look at the history you can see that why did we become the fastest uh, and maybe the first uh, cut flower exporter and, and there were many investments there so that is the paradigm change from the 70s the 70s was if you control even credit allocation you are going to define the priority sectors but then the market cannot on its, on its own create or generate the resources that are required. So it is the thinking that also changed. As you continued with the price control because of scarcity, then it became a distortion. But don't forget that it was a policy that was there at the very beginning. All these countries in, were, were fixing prices. They, the, the thinking then was that for a young nation, it is going to direct growth in priority sectors. But then over time, the market starts uh, seeing that it is a constraint. As foreign exchange dipped, then controls tightened. Throughout the 1980s, Kenya's foreign exchange situation remained precarious. It was under these difficult circumstances that Duncan Degwa exited the helm of the central bank in April 1983. He was succeeded by Philip Degwa, until then the chairman of KCB. Major problems for the financial sector of the economy would however continue, despite the change of guard at the central bank. The shilling continued to steadily depreciate against major world currencies. By December 1992, the shilling had gone from 7.143 to the dollar in 1972 to 36.216. In March 1993, the shilling was devalued by 25%, raising its exchange rate to the dollar to 45. Three months later, the dollar exchange rate had skyrocketed to 65. Any form of controls creates a rationing mechanism. Be it food uh, prices, or be it anything that you impose control creates a, rational, a, a rationing device. So essentially, because the market must clear, then it creates a, a capside, a parallel market to clear it. Now, that's, maybe that's too technical, but the most important thing is to say that if you are an exporter and you are exporting coffee, then you export to Europe and you get euros, do you have an incentive to bring those euros to Kenya when you know that you will have different difficulties trying to get it out? So that that incentive uh, that, that allows you to have an incentive not to declare so essentially the company the country start getting less and less of foreign exchange reserves similarly are you going to produce maize if you know that you are you are going to produce it at a price that is determined by the government and sometimes your cost of production will be higher so the, the then you have an incentive to produce and hold but because sometimes it can be criminal, then sometimes it's you refuse to produce. So, in a, in a sense, it creates a disincentive to produce. It creates a disincentive to trade in the market because the prices are controlled. You cannot, you, 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 I cannot export because those proceeds, I will not get them, so I will not be flexible. It allows transfer pricing because then I would rather keep my money out there because I'm flexible with it. So essentially, it means that because of the dis Torsion it creates in the market it will never come back to it. I can say the former Steve stage stages of the central bank from 1966 was very very important. Those formative stages were very, because they laid down the, the, the what should have what should be done. Those formative years are very very important, and you can imagine those are the times when we have uh, we had a Polish from IMF seconded here as the governor, and then we have we had uh, Governor Duncan Dewa. And then after that, Governor Philip Dewa. You can see the formative years. But then there came the troubled uh, periods because of various problems, both social political problems. And then there were quite a, quite a turmoil until then Governor Chesarem came to put some order. I took over the Central Bank, as you are aware, in July 1993. And 
in the previous year, in 1992, prior to the elections, up to the elections, it appears the government released a lot of money into the economy. So there was too much money in circulation. And when I was appointed in July, inflation was running at 80%. The value of the currency was falling very rapidly. And there was no foreign exchange. So when I arrived, challenge number one was the staff. There was a lot of indiscipline in the staff, morale was very low and obviously because of those exchange control days and golden bag, there has been a lot of rent seeking, dishonest behavior. So I had to deal with that. Secondly, at the bank itself, as I told you, there was already a lot of money in the economy. So we had to mop it up. We have to bring the money back, raise interest rates to bring the money back. Then we had to really remove remaining exchange controls because that was the big problem. And the other problem, up until my arrival, the central bank would not bounce a government check. The government could draw as much money as they wanted from central bank, even if they had no money. That really compromised everything. So we had to bring in a law to say there has to be a limit. And that has helped a lot. That limiting that government cannot draw any money. So as soon as we arrived, it was agreed that all the government can draw money if they have credit on their account. And what they had to do is go to the treasury, check that there is money in their account. All their checks didn't come to central bank direct. They had to go through treasury. And that has helped the nation. Even as the central bank tried to stabilize the foreign exchange situation, banks continued to face rising incidents of fraud. In August 1980, alarm was raised over the loss of millions of shillings from commercial banks through cash theft and forgery of client signatures. In August 2012, Kenyan banks had reportedly lost over 4 billion Kenya shillings in the previous 18 months to fraudsters operating in collaboration with bank employees. This was despite Parliament having raised the minimum fine for crimes in the banking industry from 1 to 20 million Kenya shillings. Besides the deterrent of heavy fines, banks would use advanced technology to thwart robbers and fraudsters. The use of technology in banking in Kenya, in fact, dates back to the days of the National Bank of India. The technology in use at the time, manual weighing scales, was fairly crude and mechanical. The weighing scales were manufactured in London and shipped in already calibrated and ready for use. They came in varying sizes and used different weighing stones whose fixed weight was the equivalent of a certain amount of rupees. We started with adding machine. Then we came to posting machine that means doing, doing the, the ledgers and the, what we call the waste. You know where you write on the records, which used to be on, we, keep, we advanced to the machines. From machines now we graduated to more than that. That means, uh, yes, technology had a quite a big impact on us. Huge volumes of books were used for purposes of keeping accounts as well as documents that constituted powers of attorney and wills. Customers were issued with passbooks in which all their transactions with the bank were entered by clerks. Checks were mostly the preserve of companies and individual clients who were very wealthy. And in the 1950s, it took longer than a month for a check to clear. This improved to 21 days in the 1980s compared to two days at present. Beginning in the late 1960s, the main banks started investing in computerizing their operations. Barclays Bank of Kenya was the first bank to fully computerize its operations in the country. Its Barclays International Accounting System computer program was rolled out in November 1982, with its Enterprise Road Nairobi branch being the first beneficiary. 
other banks would eventually follow suit and computerize operations in their branches. In 1989, Stanchart pioneered the use of debit cards and automated telemachines or ATMs. Barclays, KCB and Coop Bank followed not long thereafter. By early 2000, bank customers were able to access services from any branch of their bank, unlike before when one had to go to their branch. ATMs were enhanced to offer a variety of services besides cash withdrawal. These included cash and check deposit, issuance of mini statements, and transfer of money directly to another account within the bank. Banks also interconnected their ATM networks, thereby allowing customers to access the services on ATMs beyond those of their banks. A case in point is the PESA point network of ATMs to which the majority of banks subscribe. An even more innovative system of banking would come with the launch of the M-PESA mobile money transfer system by Safaricom in 2007. M-PESA has drastically transformed the way the majority of Kenyans send and receive money. Currently, most banks have adopted and integrated the M-PESA concept in their everyday services. We are seeing the tip of the iceberg. M-PESA may eventually revolutionize and it will. Banking will not be what we know. All these banking holes, you should not be thinking what to do with them. <laughs> because you may eventually find you can take your loan through mobile money. That is the new development. I think uh, mobile money is a major breakthrough. But uh, I think we need to remember mobile money is just a product. So it complements the huge range of banking services by easing uh, the issue of um, uh, money transfer. I would see that as the greatest threat maybe to money transfer systems uh, that existed previously, but complements the banks. At the same time, gives the bank an opportunity to add money transfer as an additional product. I will say the biggest contribution of money transfer as it has been done in Kenya was to really legitimize the use of technology. The phobia <laughs> of uh, trusting <laughs> a phone, again, that has been dissipated uh, by the money transfer. And uh, the future of banking, using the mobile phone as a delivery, has been given a huge boost. Most banks are also offering internet banking, where customers can transact their business on personal computers or smartphones in the comfort of their homes or offices. I can tell you that in 2002, we had only 1.9 million deposit accounts. Today, we have 17.6 million deposit accounts. Because you are able to save your money through M-Shuari. So let's say, assume you are somewhere you, somewhere you cannot even have a, a bank account because there is no bank near you, but you can use the mobile phone. Technology is important in banking, but it is beneficial only when it is used by employees who understand not just the technology, but the intricacies of the banking industry. In the pre-independence days, most banking staff were European and Asian. Africans entered the industry in low and junior positions. There was little facility for training local staff. Barclays DCO was the first bank to set up a local training school in Nairobi sometime in the early 1950s. The training school, which was to serve the entire East Africa region, was necessitated by a pressing need to train competent local staff to cope with a rapidly expanding branch network. It was on the back of this training school that Barclays rapidly expanded operations in Kenya, culminating in the opening of its 100th branch in Kenya at Mandera in 1968. The Barclays Bank Training School would be followed by others. Standard Bank of South Africa 
opened a training college in Nairobi in 1958. Bank of India and Bank of Baroda opened a joint school in October 1969. Co-op Bank would later start its cooperative training college at Karen in Nairobi where also KCB's sprawling training and development center was opened in 1991. Subsequently, most banks set up their own colleges. In 1994, the Central Bank and Commercial Bank joined in the setting up of the Kenya School of Monetary Studies, which became registered with the Ministry of Education as a tertiary institution offering diploma and certificate courses. The central bank is the principal shareholder with 99% share and the remaining 1% held by the treasury. Training enough Africans to take over the banking industry took time. What took even longer was to get enough women to play a leading role in banking. It was not until after independence that African women began to feature on the staff of many banks. Even then, they were mostly employed in junior positions as cashiers, secretaries and receptionists. Mary Okello entered the annals of Kenyan banking history when in 1977 she became the first African woman to rise to the post of a bank branch manager. Her promotion at Barclays Bank opened the door for more women to rise to management positions in Kenyan banks. Yeah, when I joined banking, the conditions there were not very accommodating to women and they were not very supportive, both as employees and, and as uh, customers. Being the first, I had to prove that women can make it, because if I failed, I would have failed the other women also mm -hmm. and they would have been saying oh we gave her a chance she didn't make it so it would have closed doors to many women mm -hmm. so i really had to prove that women can make it yeah. i'll give you an example uh, in 77 i was given um, i was promoted and sent to westlands branch mm -hmm. it was a rundown branch the morale was low it was not making a profit so when I went in there, I knew if I didn't turn it round, it would, they would say, you know, look at these women. You give them an opportunity. But by the grace of God, I turned it down. We started making profit. The morale went up. Because there are more women now. And if you look around, there are many women CEOs. There are more women in managerial positions in the bank. We have had women directors. We have women sharing banks, so I think things have changed. Not many banks followed Barclays' practice. Banking in Kenya continued to be dominated by men until the 1990s, when calls for affirmative action began to affect employment practices across a wide spectrum of sectors of the country's economy. Today, women are employed in the banking industry as much as men, if not more. Some notable women who have risen to high positions in banking in recent times include Nasim Devji, the Chief Executive Officer of the Diamond Trust Bank Group, who is also the first woman appointed CEO of a bank in Kenya. Anne Mutahi, Chairperson of Standard Chartered Bank Kenya. Nyambura Koigi, the Managing Director of Postbank. Vindhya Vital Ramesh, CEO of Bank of Baroda, Kenya. Jacinta Mwatella, a former Deputy Governor of the Central Bank. Rose Detho, Director of Central Bank's Deposit Protection Fund. And Sheila Mbijiwe, a former Director at Stanchart and currently a member of the Central Bank's Monetary Policy Committee. And gender sensitivity has not been confined to only employment policies. It has also affected services in a number of banks. In Baroda, we have encouraged a totally all women's branch in Nayali. Yeah. My head of credit is a lady, yeah. and uh, all my branches are headed by for trade finance and forex is headed by a woman, yeah. and most of the branches, the credit and important portfolios, held by a manager who is a lady. 
Other banks that offer accounts designed for women include Chase Bank, Fina Bank, INM, and Standard Chartered. On the whole, however, bank employment policies in general have affected the development of banking in the country. Relations between banks and their staff have been fairly cordial. This has been mainly due to the operations of the Kenya Bankers Association, which was set up by eight banks, namely Bank of Baroda, Bank of India, Barclays DCO, General Bank of the Netherlands, Habib Bank, National Bank of India, Ottoman Bank and Standard Chartered Bank. The association was actually set up in 1962 and then it was called the Kenya Bankers Employers Association. And as the name implied, it was um, uh, because the industry was growing and the employers, as bankers as employers, felt that there was a need to bring the employers together and handle, at that point in time, the industrial relations that they needed to handle collectively. So initially, the association mainly handled the collective bargaining agreement with negotiating the CBA with the, with the unions on behalf of the employer, which then was collectively doing it together under the umbrella of the Kenya Bankers Employers Association. The biggest confrontation between banks and their staff came on August 3rd, 1998, when employees of all banks in Kenya started an industry-wide strike that severely crippled banking operations in the country. And the employees' grievances were not directed at anything the banks had done. The workers were protesting government plans to tax their low-interest loans as a benefit. They were also up in arms over the government's introduction of a fringe benefit tax. The strike persisted for five days, despite government threats that it was illegal. It was only disrupted by the bomb blast at the American Embassy in Nairobi on August 7th that year, which killed more than 280 people and injured even more. The staff returned to work so as not to worsen the public sentiment following the deadly terror attack. Since then, relations between the banking industry and its staff have been cordial. One of our key roles as, a, as an entity, we have mentioned the industrial relations which has been there and uh, we still continue doing, but our role has sort of like expanded and we see ourselves moving more into the advocacy uh, arena where we try to proactively influence policy uh, formulation uh, process. And so we engage the stakeholders in the policy formulation um, arena. And that's where our engagement with the parliamentarians, for example, comes in. Our engagement with the Treasury, um, because we submit, for example, to the Treasury proposals of um, policy proposals that we intend to see in the budget as the budget is being formulated. And that we do um, every year. And some of the proposals that we do make forth and defend at the budget committee level eventually end up in the, in the budget proposal. Not all, but a number of them will end up in the budget proposal uh, document. Now, um, in terms of engaging the other parliamentarians, for example, you, you may recall um, uh, for the last almost one and a half years, there was a debate about legislating the interest rates. And there were arguments for and against and uh, we thought that it was a responsibility as an industry to enlighten or give our views to the parliamentarians who are in the process of trying to propose a legislation that we thought will have significant effects on the whole operation of the banking industry. So we had to give our side of, um, of, 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 of the story and we engaged them quite, uh, quite, 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 quite um, uh, aggressively because we had several meetings with parliamentarians, different parliamentary committees. Uh, we were summoned to various uh, sessions of uh, the parliamentary committee briefings and uh, eventually I think our view was, was had. Much of what has happened in the commercial banking sector has been mirrored by the operations of non-bank financial institutions that provide specialized financial services such as mortgage, higher purchase financing, secured installment loans and trade credit. They constitute a crucial segment of financial intermediaries beside commercial banks. 
Diamond Trust Kenya Limited was the first non-bank financial institution to be established in Kenya. It was established in 1946 as Diamond Jubilee Investments, initially covering the entire East Africa region. Savings and loans followed in 1949, focusing mainly on mortgage finance. An important role in Kenya's financial sector is now played by a special type of non-bank financial institution, the Savings and Credit Cooperative Societies, or SACOs. They provide millions of Kenyans with essential financial services that they normally cannot access through banks, especially easier access to credit, albeit sometimes at higher interest rates. They span nearly all the sectors of the economy. Indeed, they have been credited with spurring Kenya's ongoing real estate boom. That was the history of banking in Kenya. But what of the future? What challenges and opportunities do Kenyan banks face in the next decade or two? Going forward and uh, casting our eyes uh, to the next uh, 10 to 20 years, banks are confronted by enormous challenges. The first one uh, is technology innovations. Technology is bringing uh, previously uh, unimagined competition into the banking space. The second challenge that uh, banks have to contend with uh, is consumer uh, protection and consumer agitation. In the past, banks have dealt by and large uh, with consumers who were not, uh, who were not very exposed. Uh, this was their first uh, relationship in financial service and banks uh, uh, were more privileged to be more knowledgeable than the customer. But certainly the customer have changed. The customer is now educated, they know their rights, and they are demanding. The third challenge that uh, undoubtedly will pose a huge challenge to the bank is what you could call uh, democratic, uh, the, uh, demographic changes. Banks were used to, on average, uh, to have a customer who was on uh, 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 above 40 years, 50 years, with uh, a demography that shows the average age uh, of uh, the population will be 25. Uh, but I don't know, banks will have to do a lot to adjust to this unique um, uh, Generation Y and Generation X uh, type of uh, customer with very different demands. The main challenges are, I will look at them as twofold. One is uh, there's a huge proportion of Kenyans out there who either are unbanked completely or they are underbanked. So from the statistics available, we are just about, I think in 2009, this, the, the data was at just about 30% of Kenyans who are banked. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge proportion of Kenyans out there who don't have access to banks or are uh, in, uh, inadequately accessed. So they don't have all what they require from the banking system. And our challenge, I think, as an industry will be to access our services to those uh, Kenyans who do not have access. The other challenge is the cost of uh, those services. Um, th there has been, um, an, I would say there has been more or less like an outcry of the fact that the cost of the banking services, and maybe not just banking services, but I'll say financial services, is too high for the consumer. And so we have got that twin challenge, access our services to the person who is not currently being accessed and bring the cost of those services down. In 2012, the Kenya Bankers Association celebrated its 50th anniversary barely a year before the nation's own Golden Jubilee celebration of independence. The occasion brought together leading personalities in the banking industry, both past and present, as well as a number of key officials, including the president of the African Development Bank, Donald Kaberuka, and the minister for finance, Njeru Githai. Addressing guests at the gathering, Habil Olaka, 
chief executive officer of the association, paid glowing tribute to Kenyan bankers and their staff for their important role in shaping Kenya's history throughout the nation's first 50 years of independence. Ladies and gentlemen, when I look at KBA's beginnings, during a time when our country was yet to gain self-rule, to today, I'm humbled and thankful for all the support and partnership that we have received from all our various stakeholders. We are invigorated by our new tagline, One Industry Transforming Kenya, which illustrates our commitment to our country. Through the strength and commitment of our members, I wish to reassure the Kenyan public and all our industry stakeholders that Kenya's banking sector doors are open. We will listen and we will work together to build our economy. Uh, okay, if you know Bank of Baroda, it's uh, mostly by the western part of India where the Bank of Baroda started. Baroda is a place which is in Gujarat. And if you see the ethnically, the Gujaratis who were also migrated to Kenya along with the railway line. Uh, so, uh, somewhere along the line, there was a community of Gujaratis who had settled in here. And basically, these people are business people. Okay, they developed business in India. They were thriving. And alongside, uh, they also were developing in Kenya. So, somewhere along, you have this feeling. Uh, you want to go back home. So, they were coming to India. So, somewhere that connection between Baroda and it, it, the Indians, Asians settled in Kenya was there already. And the Bank of Baroda being the bank uh, in that area, it became a bank for those people coming from Africa to India. Automatically, because of business mindedness, uh, other businesses developed like those days, remittances between the two countries, inward and outward remittances, and uh, technical uh, assistance in the form of you can do trade this way. Lot of things happened at that time. So Baroda was one of those banks growing that time, all, already knew about what is happening outside in Africa. So it was natural that when the bank was started growing in 1953, 54, uh, the bank also decided now we need to go out of India. So the first thought came, why not Africa, where we already have our brothers and sisters settled and doing well. If you look at Bank of India and Bank of Baroda, both of them are from the western part of India at that particular point of time. And both had similar client base and also they were in a way competitors with each other. They were of similar size, similar st strategies and similar thinking and similar client base. So they, are, they were also the same people who came at that time. In those early days, it's very interesting. At that particular point of time, if you know Kenya, they had all, all the banks were mostly European and English. Okay. Uh, the, when this, when Bank of Baroda and Bank of India came in, it was looked like an Asian banker. It's not possible because business and banking was only for the Europeans. So that was a challenge. And once again, at that particular point of time, a bank had failed, a financial institution has failed. It was of uh, Indian origin. So everybody, the perception was they can't do. You can't rely on them. This was again a challenge to the bank had to face these two challenges and grow. At the time, the major competition was the European bank, mm -hmm. but uh, Bank of Baroda with their ingenious strategy, mm -hmm. they broke through the challenge. The strategy was very simple. Mm -hmm. These English banks were very formal and common people could not reach them. Uh, there were a lot of layers. They could not have gone and met the MD. But the bank, Bank of Baroda being an Asian banker, they were very open and approachable to every common person. So you and me could talk to each other and understand and they provided the solution and the banking uh, facilities. So this automatically made them people's bank at that particular point of time. Small businessmen, trade, traders, everybody could come here. And also an innovative product those days, the savings account, wherein you can save a certain sum of money on a regular basis and get an interest was innovated by this bank. So it became like very popular, oh, I can also save my money. This was what was given at that time. So the bank could go through the competition yeah. successfully.
We opened in Mombasa immediately within a year we opened the Nairobi branch. But once these two branches were settling down, we realized there are pockets of business areas like in Kisumu, like in Eldoret. But if you remember in 1960s, the communication lines were very bad. Uh, infrastructure was really not there. But how to serve those people in those places? Business was happening there. So Bank of Baroda found an innovative way banking on wheels which we today we call it a mobile banking which in 1960 was a very rarity it happened that time they were commuting to that city and taking the bank doing the banking service there and putting the money in Nairobi this was in even for Bank of Baroda this was the first experiment banking on wheels in Kisumu and from Kisumu and Kenya it migrated to India where it became the most popular uh, service of today So independence in every country opens a lot of doors. It's the when when you are independent, automatically it becomes the people's country, and the con even the government have to work for the betterment of the citizen of that country. At that point of time, everybody gets an opportunity, and when they take the opportunity, even the banking or financial institution has to cater to those opportunities arising. So when independence happened, automatically the Kenyans started developing, maybe slowly from healthcare, education and everything. So the Asian bank, Indian bank, which already was here, decided to also become a subsidiary that is become Bank of Baroda Kenya Limited and they started catering to all the local populace. Kenya and India is not very different in this gender uh, differences because in both the countries family is the mainstay and the responsibility of bringing up the family and culture is almost with the woman. This is the uh, this is the similar case in both the countries. Here in Kenya again, the it is the same story. The woman had to take care of everything. At that particular point of time, if you know, uh, woman cannot move too much away from the family. Woman cannot give long hours to be very competitive in her uh, chosen career. She had to give equal time a little more time to the family. So at that particular point of time, Bank of Baroda, the institution banking and Baroda in particular uh, were uh, doing a lot for the woman. See the jobs available in bank is particular timing. It's maybe from 9 to 5 or 9 to 6. Mm -hmm. There is a definite timing. She is not re required to work late hours. She can easily do her job, go home, take care of the children. So and also the financial reward was quite good. Mm -hmm to take care of the family. This itself was a platform for the woman to come into banking jobs. And again, when the woman came into the banking job, she was encouraged to in increase her educational qualification and um, skills. Once this was done, automatically she was encouraged to take higher positions. Uh, though this was not done aggressively, in a subtle way, giving an economic freedom automatically brought them up. This you can see by the 34 percent woman representation in Bank of Baroda, Kenya itself. I left Mango December 1946. Remember that very clearly. Then I came, I didn't go, I came and I stayed with Sylvester Diambo, my uncle. Yes, he had next six meters. That's landed rupees, whatever you call it. Yes. You know, when I left Mango, well, I was what, 19? Yes, 19. Original the idea was to go to Makere to be a teacher. Even Father Tana from Yala came to interview us at Amang. All those boys who were from Nyanza. 
but somehow I didn't feel very much inclined to be a teacher after that. But I came here. Then in March, or beginning of the March, my uncle told me, you know, I work with a color singer in the railway, what do you call it, factory foundry. And his son says, Barclays Bank wants African clerks. Now you see that just like a chance. And my uncle told me, if you try it. I said, well. So I came to Barclays Bank, Queensway here. I had an interview. They gave me maths and English. I think out of five read or six maths question, I think I got four out of six, if I remember correctly. And the man who was interviewing me, a British man, quite a strict man, but quite a good man all the same. Say so he could have done better than that, but anyway, four out of six is not bad. Mm -hmm. But he was very much impressed by my handwriting. That beautiful handwriting. So that plus my handwriting, say I think will give you a chance. <coughs> so you said, I did not choose to go to the bank. It is what we call, uh, will you call it a fate? Through the old man talking to another old man and the son saying that the bank wants some African clerks. And that's how I came to the bank. The bank was being run by British, managerial, but the bank, people who really work with Asians, they were the majority, and uh, call it really, they were the technician. Whether you're a cashier, a tailor, what, head of department, they're all Asians. With a few go when I in between, but they're all Asians. When I joined Barclays Bank, there was Mr. Stephen Mwangi, who was with me in Mango, who was a, my classmate, but he did not go to upper class. After junior, secondary, he left. And he ended up by joining Barclays Bank. So when I joined him, Stephen was there as the, more or less the first African to join Barclays. And then we had a Mr. Saja, telephone operator, who was a Ugandan, beautiful English speaking. So we were three. Later on, we were joined by someone called uh, Daniel Omoto from Kakamega. Later, we were joined by my senior mole. You have met him, Samuel Ambundo. Ambundo joined Barclays Bank in Kampala but he was transferred here. Being a Kenyan, they didn't want him to be in Uganda. They told him, you go to Kenya. And that's how we came. So we were, say, about five Africans. Out of, I will leave a question, how many will we say we were there? I don't know the numbers. You could say that probably we had uh, six or seven Europeans in the branch. The majority Asians. So you had number one, Amzungo. Number two, a nation. Number three, an Arab. Number four, an Africa. And salary wise, the same. All I remember, a European used to get about a hundred. Yes, which was a very good salary, you know. And then a nation was more or less around half of that. And an African, because there are Arabs were very few, if I remember correctly, really, my salary was 16 shillings. The African customers were very few. Because business-wise, economical-wise, we, we didn't have the weight. We're still good farmers at home, and what not produce water, chicken, and other things. 
laki economic le huwe akasma ukul kama nboro we didn't have that that came much later and there were, not all, there were also restrictions about our of african borrowing and this was uh, what we call uh, what the statute is because uh, First, you can't le lend an offering more than 2,000. And you couldn't lend an African woman unless uh, the husband said this and that. And uh, it went on like that, but still we, they wanted because of the deposit. All the same, the banks went in for Africans to encourage them to come and bring deposit. I'll give you an example. When I was in Bungoma, I could open an account with one shilling. I went around the societies and asked them to open an account with one shilling. The same thing when I was transferred to Kisi. My job was go around and get the societies and African farmers to open at least an account and with one shilling. So you have a ledger with 20 people, customers, but their balance is one, 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 one shilling. But that was the first step trying to introduce or to attract an African way of banking. Yet, they wanted to borrow money. But individually, the obstacles, apart from the societies. Don't forget that the government was encouraging societies. You had the coffee society, you had tea societies. In Bungoma particularly, it was Kimilil area, coffee society. We had to go for them. No, it was simply that uh, management as such had one well, were getting interested in having African join the bank. I'll explain that. Perhaps the bank saw that the future an African will be more important. They were not looking at it political as such, but with a future element of having customers. That's how they came to get interested. Now, we asked me a question of promotion. We were so few in the bank. Incidentally, although we were fewer, we had a better education. You know, coming from a man with your school certificate or anywhere else with school certificate, compared with some of the Asians I was working with who didn't have that, you know, they were being employed because they were Asians. Yeah. And some of these were from India. We were fewer, but more educated. And our English was, our English was better. I give my example, really. It's my writing and my English which really brought me up. As simple as that. Stephen, Raja, Samuel, all those who came, Daniel Omoto, the English was good. And it attracted them. I may say, what else will I say attracted the, the African, or rather the management of Africans? He's preparing for the future. Now, when we come to talk about advancement, even with it, we're looking around for the independence to come. I was taken to England, my first course seminar, in 1956. By then, I'd worked for the bank for only nine years. But they saw it that uh, because Barclays Bank was dominion, colonial, and overseas. It covers all that. And one of the ideas is mix the younger generation from all over this area. And that was the first step why I was taken to, to England to meet others from Egypt, from Sudan, from West Indies, from West Africa, or everywhere Barclays Bank had. You are the trainees taken and met at the seminars. We st the bank started arranging for our education much earlier than the, than, the, than the government can give them credit.
it came when the agriculture side of it was being pushed and the farmers started having money. Give that credit to really agriculture side of the Ministry of Agriculture. Really, they are the people who pushed and this, the banks now started to take interest. These are potential, potential customers. And that explains why we were told to go and open even with one one shilling. There's a basic, open one one shilling, but the idea was in future there will be good customers. The changes which were taking place in the country now, 56, we were not talking very much about Kenya independence, although it came, eh? No. But here is a growing, a growing list of African students coming from high school. And here you are, quite a big chunk of Asians who are not Kenya citizens. You know, we brought, what do you call it, in the, what do you call in labor when you bring people out, like the Goans who, who People were, the bank recruited people from Goa to come and work here, but they were not, they were not Kenya citizens. And even a lot of Asians who are not Kenya citizens were British. To me, the way I think is, they saw in future, they got to rely on the Indians. That's the way I look at it. And I can see even my being pushed going up, Samuel and others, the few who could work and who proved that they could work. Once they realize that you have got it, they'll push you. Let me give you a background first. You join, you join as a clerk. In England, I'll just give a comparison. You can even join as a tea boy, and then you, you graduate <laughs> to clerical and so forth. It was more or less here, but here you studied the clerical. One way of training you at the branch level is going through each and every department. The more departments you do, it means you have got, you gain more experience, the better were your chances to be promoted. And in my case particularly, I owe it to some very good Europeans in the bank and also very good senior Asians. I can remember Dias, I go on, was the head of the department. The way he taught us what to do, me and the Samuel. I can remember Guju Kutran Singh. They used to run the photos here, down here. I can remember these old people now, I can remember. Uh, guru, the son died recently, but one still a doctor around here. They were good. There was, of course, yes, the color, but I don't see this very much among in the bank as such. You are treated as one. The only thing which brought the difference is that some were earning more, and some were more serious. But when it came to training, I think I'll be to be honest. Our senior chaps were good. Yeah, when I joined banking, the conditions there were not very accommodating to women and they were not very supportive, both as employees and, and as uh, customers. Because at that time, uh, the banking laws were still based on the Napoleonic Code and the Victorian property laws. So women didn't have, you know, um, contractual rights to enter into agreements and uh, contracts. So they had to get somebody else 
Yes, and you see, once you you are considered a minor, you are excluded. <laughs> yeah, so women were really outsiders. Um, in banking, they were the untouchables. Nobody could really give loans to women. The way they treated women, uh, 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 for example, there was a woman who came, uh, a businesswoman, an outstanding woman, very competent. She needed a loan to buy a car. But because she was a woman, they needed her uh, to get uh, her husband to sign. She was a single woman at that particular time. She was a mother of girls. So really, she didn't have anybody. And I, can't, I couldn't see why they should deny her a loan just because she didn't have a male uh, to come and stand for her. So I challenged that, and I gave her a loan. Of course, my career was on the, <laughs> on, on, on the line. And then also the girls in the bank, I mean, there were some very intelligent women, but they had just resigned themselves to clerical work. So I started uh, Barclays Bank Women's Association to mentor these girls. It was also very risky because I, know, I remember I was called in head office and I was told, you are starting a union in the bank. And I said, no, this is not a union, we're just doing social work here. Yeah, so those were things some I had to challenge in the system so that at least women could move far forward. At yeah. that time, Barclays was definitely ahead because they were, I mean, the first woman bank manager came from Barclays. And also, we had some very forward-looking people in Barclays. I remember Mr. T.D. Miles, the managing director, who allowed me to attend meetings outside the country, uh, after the 1975 UN conference in Mexico, there were many meetings outside about uh, the women's status and uh, promotion of women. And he allowed me to participate and whenever I came, I used the information and the knowledge I had acquired to help, you know, uh, encourage and motivate women to not accept the status quo. If from there, there were conventions and there were many other meetings and conferences on the status of women. Mm -hmm. And I think that awakened uh, the minds of the government people to look at the status of women, to try and uh, create an, uh, an enabling environment in which women with the talents could use those talents for development. In 1994, there was a task force uh, formed by the government on laws relating to women, and they brought together women leaders in different sectors. I, I, I had the privilege of serving on the laws particularly relating to banking, and so we brought out all those clauses from the f before that restricted women's access to credit, that restricted women's uh, ability to enter into contracts. And uh, fortunately, those laws were changed. I think the expansion of education and women getting more and more educated has helped. And this girl-child girl emphasis has helped, because there are more women now, and if you look around, there are many women CEOs, there are more women in managerial positions in the bank. We have had women directors. We have women chairing banks. So I think things have changed a lot. Uh, when I was at the African Development Bank, I was instrumental in setting up the policy which has been used on the continent, you know, for women in development, making sure that uh, women have access to capital, uh, women, to decision making, empowering women. I feel very happy about that, because it wasn't very easy. But it went through, and it has made changes in the continent. Women who were employed at that time were employed as tea girls, 
or secretaries, but not very many, because at that time I think they were also using men as secretaries. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe clerks and cashiers. Mm -hmm. But even then, there were not so many. Well, I was the first, yeah. and I think they were doing it more or less as a trial. Yeah. Yes, at that time, they were taking uh, undergraduates straight from university and sending them for managerial training. Uh, I think Barclays was doing that. I don't know whether Standard Bank was doing that also. But Barclays was uh, recruiting undergraduates, yeah. and I know two people who I had known before, who were with me at Makerere, who were ahead of me, had been taken. I think this was Bob Kachechi. Yes, and uh, they, they would take them, send them to Britain for training in banking, and then they come back and they give them managerial positions. Well, the training was such that you did training in Britain, you studied the banking, uh, the institute at uh, the Institute of Bankers uh, exams then you came back and uh, you were deployed in a managerial position yes I think I came back and I was at Pioneer House did you would be like sub manager manager's assistant and then finally you get into a full branch Being the first, I had to prove that women can make it. Because if I failed, I would have failed the other women also. And they would have been saying, oh, we gave her a chance, she didn't make it. So it would have closed doors to many women. So I really had to prove that women can make it. Yeah. Take, I'll give you an example. Uh, in 77, I was given, um, I was promoted and sent to Westlands branch. It was a rundown branch. The morale was low. It was not making a profit. So when I went in there, I knew if I didn't turn it round, it would, they would say, you know, look at these women. You give them an opportunity. But by the grace of God, I turned it down. We started making profit. The morale went up. Yes. Yeah, but it was all the time you are in the spotlight. If you are the first one, everybody is looking at you. There were a few colleagues, like mm -hmm. the late World Amkuria was very supportive of me whenever, you know, mm -hmm. I was being fought. Mm -hmm. He would say, please listen, maybe this woman has something mm -hmm. that we need to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. So there were some who, you know, who were there. But there were also many bystanders who were just watching to see whether this thing was ever going to work, that women would actually uh, get access. The, the thing is that people think the environment has always been user-friendly. It hasn't. I remember when I first went into the bank, they didn't even have a toilet for women. I walked in there. This man shows me a urino. You are a woman. You know, we have come a long way. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yes. We have also had the issue of racism. Yeah. Hmm? I remember when I first came, uh, when I was a ma manager, these old settlers were still around. They come in, they ask, where is the manager? And you are saying you are the manager, and he dismisses you. And then you sit there waiting for him to realize that he will have still come back. Mm -hmm. Then he comes back and you still have to deal with him yeah. having humiliated you, yeah. but you still have to swallow because the customer is always right. So we have come a long way. The African men didn't also know how to react to you. Some would come because I was young then. Yeah. Hmm? They want to treat you like their daughter. Mm -hmm. So you are asking them questions and they want to treat you like a child. Yeah. Others want to treat you like a girlfriend. girlfriend. You know, so you had all kinds of, so you had to be yeah. astute and know how to react to them. And remember they are banks as clients, so you can't just be rough with yeah, them. No. Yeah, and uh, you know, some come, they want to patronize you, some yeah. come, they want to treat you. You know, there were all those reactions. Well, that was to help women get access to 
uh, finance and capital in a, uh, a user-friendly environment where women can uh, you know, do, do their transactions without feeling harassed, without feeling that they had to get, seek the permission of their male counterparts. Yes, and right. I think it has worked. Today, the banks, the women are the darlings of banks. Yeah. Every bank has a facility for women. You go to Barclays, you go to Barclays Bank, they have facilities for women. You go to a standard, I think, the diver, divas, and you know, all banks now have got facilities uh, targeting women. So we have come a long way. I remember when I was uh, in 92, at that time I was Vice President of Women's World Banking in New York. And when I told them that I was coming back home to run a school, I think they thought I was crazy. <laughs> no, but I'm just uh, you see, there are certain things that appeal to your heart. Yeah. And for me, working with children is very, uh, you know, it's close to my heart. I took over the Central Bank, as you are aware, in July 1993. And in the previous year, in 1992, prior to the elections, up to the elections, it appears the government released a lot of money into the economy. So there was too much money in circulation. And when I was appointed in July, inflation was running at 80%. The value of the currency was falling very rapidly. And there was no foreign exchange. So when I arrived, challenge number one was the staff. There was a lot of indiscipline in the staff. Morale was very low. And obviously because of those exchange control days and golden bag, there has been a lot of rent seeking, dishonest behavior. So I had to deal with that. Secondly, at the bank itself, as I told you, there was already a lot of money in the economy. So we had to mop it up. We have to bring the money back raise interest rates to bring the money back. Then we had to really remove remaining exchange controls because that was the big problem. And that other problem, up until my arrival, the central bank would not bounce a government check. The government could draw as much money as they wanted from central bank, even if they had no money. That really compromised everything. So we had to bring in a law to say there has to be a limit. And that has helped a lot. That limiting that government cannot draw any money. So as soon as we arrived, it was agreed that all the government can draw money if they have credit on their account. And what they had to do is go to the treasury, check that there is money in their account. All their checks didn't come to central bank direct. They have to go through treasure, and that has helped the nation. Big number one, total removal of exchange controls, total removal. No one had to come to Central Bank for foreign exchange. That's one. Second, we improved significantly bank supervision. The bank supervision of Central Bank was increased. We brought discipline in the banking system that anybody who was a director had to be vetted by the central bank, that it was a must. Um, and as I told you already, one significant step, the fact that government would not overdraw central bank, it means they cannot create liquidity. It means the value of the currency cannot fall because somebody has printed money, like Zimbabwe. That is a very major development so that, you know, you can bring in your foreign exchange. The third one, for me, when I arrived, there was virtually no foreign exchange. By the time I left, we had three months foreign exchange cover. People felt safe to bring their money back to Kenya. 
So that was significant. Yeah. They didn't have technical expertise to vet the borrowers. And they relied too much on parastatal deposits. And so the borrowers were not secured. So basically, it was a very bad culture. And we had to close them down. It was very painful. From the beginning, 1966, remember it was the East African Bank. Yeah. The bank was one. At, at 67, we had our own bank. And basically, Central Bank was a department of government, a department of treasury. Um, up until uh, 19, even when I came, you remember the exchange control days? The infamous exchange control, import licensing, the Minister for Finance, used to approve you know, all those import licenses. So there was very close relationships, but more or less to make money. The big boys, there was no lady at that moment. The big boys really made money by that close relationship. When the crisis struck in 1993, when I arrived, the donors insisted that there must be separation. That's the process when we began to stop the borrowing. That's the time when the governor's tenor was given very clearly. So it's been an evolution. But the government always felt they should have a hand in central bank. Um, but because of that crisis, everyone has seen the wisdom of giving autonomy to central bank. The price of our currency, which is exchange rate, will go up and down depending on the economy. That we must admit. If we are importing more than we are exporting, there will be shortage of foreign exchange. But Central Bank has to keep watching. If there is no fundamental change in the economy, they can allow gradual depreciation. But in the last one, the Central Bank, the Central Bank's job actually, two major things. They're supposed to work on the price stability, very low inflation and then banking stability. But I think the governor and the management went the other way around. They wanted to please the government. What did they want to do? To lower interest rates so the economy can grow. So they lowered interest rates on treasury bills as far as 2%. When money supply was going up, so that one, they just went to sleep. As long as they manage money supply, and as long as they own the two, price stability and banking stability, the currency should move the way the economy is moving. And they should explain why it is happening. But if they are temporary, things like perhaps there have been huge surge of imports, and Central Bank believes this is temporary, they can inject some foreign exchange. That's why they have got four months cover of foreign exchange. Their job is to sell into the market or to buy into the market to try and regularize the currency. Yes. So Central Bank has a role, but at times, like the last time, they went to sleep. And they quickly woke up and they tightened money supply. You saw it. Yeah, yeah they quickly, and they shouldn't have happened. Yeah. It was unfortunate. I think over the last 50 years, for sure, more people have, become, they have begun to join the banking system. There are more Kenyans banking. And in the last 10 years, 15 years, let me just pick one for commentation, um, Equity Bank. If you remember Hillary uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, the big banks, big banks, were closing branches in Cabernet, in Eldoret, and overnight, Equity Bank comes, and they open branches. And quickly, the big banks say, my God, we are losing our shirt. So one major development has been banking has come, and really, uh, more people are now banked. There is a new development, mobile money, M-Pesa. We, we are seeing the tip of the iceberg, banking, will not be what we know. All these banking holes, you should not be thinking what to do with them. <laughs> because you may eventually find 
you can take your loan through mobile money. That is the new development. Banking now, if you know, they what they call branchless banking. Before, if your branch was Lavington, you only went to Lavington to cash your check. Today, if you come from Bungoma, you can just cash your check in Bungoma. Um, <clears throat> today, on the mobile, the bank will actually notify me, my bank at least. If there's any movement on bank, bank account, they'll notify me. But then there is the danger, which we are in that fraud. These youngsters are very bright. The banks have to be very vigilant against banking fraud. Twenty years ago, Hillary, we didn't have ATM. ATM. You now go to an ATM, you withdraw your money. You go to an ATM, you bank your money. So sooner and sooner, you'll find that you don't need to go to a bank. Yes. But technology has brought more benefit than, than loss. So we are really going to see the banks become more competitive. The cost of banking must come down. And banking must go more to the people, more on the ground, and best still through the mobile. Yes. Banking industry must try and leverage on this ICT and try and lower their cost of doing business. Really, that's their biggest risk. But ICT is their best advantage. The second one, Hillary. The banks must realize for Kenya, we are, going, we are going to devolve. For Kenya, we are going to put a lot of emphasis on agriculture, service interest, education, health. The banks have been financing basically trade, trade, manufacturing. If you go to a bank and say, I want to do agriculture in Turkana, I want to do irrigation, no go area. So we would like the banks to begin thinking that certainly there are going to be bankable proposals in rural Kenya when the county governments come on many fronts, on agriculture, on private health services, private hospitals, private schools. These are areas where banks are very averse. So look at the schools which have come up without banks supporting them. If they are to support them, they would be a, a better speed. So it's going to be, we go to our bankers who think outside the box. When we look at the history of uh, banking in this country, it all started uh, with international banks, then quickly followed by government banks. And uh, African enterprise in banking uh, came late. Uh, because of the barriers uh, of entry, it, they never started as banks. They started as finance houses and building societies. And that's also where equity uh, came in, in back in 1984 as a building society. The reason why they used different uh, modes of entering the financial sector was affordability, was accessibility to licenses. Uh, so these were what you could call lighter uh, regimes uh, or organizations uh, that were a stepping stone towards becoming banks. The building societies were uh, built on uh, an archaic uh, legal framework of 1948, uh, the old mutual uh, act uh, of uh, United uh, Kingdom. And essentially, it was a very restrictive uh, uh, law 
in the sense that uh, building society uh, were not uh, participating in clearing houses, they could not offer current accounts, they could not deal with foreign uh, exchange. Consequently, they could only then deal uh, with the clients who were in a niche that didn't require those type of sophisticated product. So essentially, equity started as uh, a building society serving tea farmers, rural communities, and in urban centers, serving uh, what you could call like the Nairobi City Council, then uh, low salary staff. It is, so it was more of um, one of the majority uh, in society, what you could look bottom of the pyramid. That was the niche that building societies were serving. It is true after some time uh, we realized the building society concept uh, had its limitations. And as I said, the first one was the age of products that you could be able to offer. The convenience of the checkbook was not available. The clearing of transactions. So it then uh, became apparent that uh, building society was just a first step uh, before becoming a bank. And so we started the migratory path uh, of transforming and converting into a bank so that we could be able to offer a wide range uh, of financial products to the people and also move to a more robust legal framework under the Banking Act, which was more regulated and which was more uh, robust. Moving from a building society to a bank uh, meant confronting a lot of challenges. The first biggest hurdle was the legal uh, challenges. Uh, the legal framework, uh, the regulatory environment was completely different. Building societies uh, were designed to, uh, to be registered and be registered only as building society. There was no legal migration path. So it required doing 14 amendments to the Building Societies Act to allow that. The second one was uh, the onerous uh, regulatory requirements. Suddenly, uh, you move from um, the registrar of building society then, uh, who didn't have uh, the capacity to supervise, and you go now under the supervision of the central bank, which had really established authority, had the capability. So it, it became very, very onerous, meeting things like cash ratio, liquidity ratio. Those became new concepts uh, to be complied with. The capital requirement was also completely different uh, in terms of it. So uh, one was uh, at uh, 5 million shillings, and you go to 150 million shillings. So that was, the second one was human capacity. In a building society, it was simple one uh, feet product uh, for all. And suddenly you now go to complex sophisticated products like uh, treasury products, LCs, guarantees, clearing house, and again that then. And lastly, the other big challenge uh, was uh, the issue of competition. Suddenly, you now come uh, uh, direct confrontation with the established international banks and government uh, banks that sees a new entrant who needs to be stopped at, uh, uh, at the edge. And suddenly, that then changes because you are now eating their pie. And uh, the pie was very small. It was only 4% of the population that had bank accounts. And suddenly, you're coming to partake to this. So, of course, competition became quite safe. So I would say those are the four major challenges that we had uh, to really confront. But the most uh, tricky one was uh, really getting human capacity, resource, human resources that had the competence uh, uh, to be able to take us on the, uh, the new path. Uh, the biggest failure uh, came uh, to a great extent uh, uh, by mismanagement. As we said, the competences, the skills were not very resident uh, in the majority of the people. The conflict between ownership uh, and management, particularly in governance, was also a major cause. And the reason why we succeeded was uh, very strong governance structures from the onset. We separated ownership and management, and that helped us a lot. Uh, uh, I myself came as uh, a manager, 
uh, not uh, from, I was not uh, in the ownership structure. And that separation allowed us to really manage what we could say conflict uh, and greed that was eminent that uh, when people saw money, they assumed it was their money and not the depositors' money and diversified their investment using insider borrowing. So we were able to avoid uh, that curse. The second one, uh, of course, was uh, that helped us was at a very early stage, uh, we started seeking support uh, from uh, outsiders. I remember in um, uh, the early 80s, we got uh, technical support uh, from uh, DFID, Microsoft, Swiss Contact, that helped us to understand some uh, of the concept. And lastly, it was the desire to succeed. We had a burning desire at least to create an indigenous organization that could survive because, as I said, uh, the whole environment was littered with the uh, uh, graves of indigenous. Uh, almost 30 had failed. So uh, the determination that uh, truly we are going to have one of our own uh, making it to the other side uh, so that it can be telling the story uh, it inspired us a lot to succeed. Looking back, uh, there are three uh, factors that stand out that made equity succeed where others failed. Uh, and the first one was a different business model. Equity creatively and innovatively redesigned the banking model from the traditional one. We wanted a banking model that was relevant to the people, accessible to the people, and affordable to the people. So we moved from the traditional banking model to a, high, a low margin, high volume uh, business model driven by technology to minimize cost. So we, became, uh, we reduced uh, uh, the um, cost of access by a factor of nine. We reduced uh, the uh, cost of uh, banking, the real financial cost by a factor of four. And essentially that helped to, to open the opportunity. The second thing that uh, uh, helped uh, equity succeed and resonate uh, with the, uh, the, the masses was product development. We developed a unique capability in product development such that we could develop products that were relevant to the farmers, whether it's a savings account, whether it is a borrowing account, whether it's a micro account, uh, that helped uh, us a lot such that we developed products that answered to the needs of the previously excluded. And lastly uh, was our unique way of seeing risks. Uh, what we started seeing risks differently. When the banks thought of banking, the only 4% that was bankable, we said then this is a niche. 96% that is not banked is the market. And we asked, why do we see the risk that are being seen that makes this 96 to be uh, excluded? We see it different. And that helped us to develop methodologies like a group reading, group guarantees uh, that could mitigate the risk. So our unique perception of risks, different from uh, any other bank into the market, a different business model, and a range of uh, products and services that were tailor-made to the unique circumstances of this excluded uh, uh, population enabled us to be accessible to the unbanked population. It is true that uh, innovation uh, and uh, creativity has been uh, the biggest uh, driver of transformation of our banking industry. An equity uh, bank uh, eventually became the uh, leader of the technology and innovation frontier. And the first one that we became a global first uh, was uh, the mobile or cell phone mapped bank accounts, whereby uh, delivery moved from the uh, branches, moved away from the ATMs and other electronic to delivery through the cell phone. That alone brought so much convenience 
an ease of banking in the sense that uh, distance was completely breached. The bank was in everybody's pockets, the bank was in everybody's hearts. It was not the 70 kilometers where the branch used to previously to be. The second innovation, uh, again using technology, was uh, bridging uh, access to the, fi uh, to the last mile, where we said uh, banking is expensive, not because the charges are high, but the cost of accessing the bank itself, the public transport, the time it requires, is what creates uh, uh, the uh, exorbitant cost of access. And we said, what about if we converted shopkeepers into agents uh, of the bank and you have the basic transactions of withdrawals, deposits being done at... Uh, by the village shopkeeper and creating agency again another number one for equity in the world again fully um, made banking very very ac uh, accessible and lastly it is uh, the paperless banking where you said uh, the blue and pink deposit and withdraw papers uh, were a huge in, uh, inhibition because it meant the illiterate people had to look for somebody to fill this and uh, removing them from the banking hall. Uh, and particularly also getting the image of a person captured by our IT uh, system without uh, having to come with a, a passport size uh, uh, photograph. Again, that truly opened uh, and removed the humiliation and the indignity of exposing people's uh, literacy level in the banking hall and making them really uh, vulnerable uh, to others. So I, I would say those three aspects uh, in terms of innovations were very, very strong. Going forward and uh, casting our eyes uh, to the next uh, 10 to 20 years, Banks are confronted by enormous challenges. The first one uh, is technology innovations. Technology is bringing uh, previously uh, unimagined competition into the banking space. We have just talked about uh, mobile uh, 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 money transfer, uh, what people call ma uh, mobile banking. Again, that has brought telecoms into the banking space. That, that it would be uh, the least, would have been the least expected uh, source of competition. So uh, we're saying um, uh, that uh, in the next 10, uh, 20 years, uh, banks might be disrupted <laughs> by uh, use of technology. Uh, things like Google, things like Facebook uh, are coming in and you'll never, little, cha uh, little uh, uh, chains uh, of and suppliers may threaten banks. So it is unlikely that competition will come from the traditional bank uh, environment. The second challenge that uh, banks have to contend with uh, is consumer uh, protection and consumer agitation. In the past, banks have dealt by and large uh, with consumers who are not, uh, who were not very exposed. Uh, this was their first uh, relationship in financial service and banks uh, uh, were more privileged to be more knowledgeable than the customer. But certainly the customer have changed. The customer is now educated, they know their rights, and they are d d demanding. The third challenge that uh, undoubtedly will pose a huge challenge to the bank is uh, what you could call uh, democratic, uh, de uh, demographic changes. Banks were used to, on average, uh, to have a customer who was on uh, 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 above 40 years, 50 years, with uh, a demography that shows the average age uh, of uh, the population will be 25. Uh, but I don't know, banks will have to do a lot to adjust to this unique um, uh, Generation Y and Generation X uh, type of uh, customer with very different demands, uh, with uh, decorporatization, uh, de where banks were used to dealing with uh, corporate customers, and suddenly that has been decorporatized to what you could call SMEs and informal learning 
then uh, it's the onerous challenge of learning how to deal with this new uh, customer is likely to be a huge challenge. However, with these challenges also come huge opportunities. This younger generation, Y generation, X, is likely to give banks a huge opportunity of using technology. The technology is they are very knowledgeable, so they know what they want, they can articulate. Uh, that is a huge opportunity to move from brick and mortar uh, to technology uh, as a delivery channel. The possibility uh, in the 20 years uh, uh, that uh, we are casting our eyes to, that the economy will move from a developing third world country to a middle income economy shows that a huge number uh, or a huge proportion of the population will transform into middle income. And again, uh, with um, larger amounts of disposable income, higher appetite uh, for uh, facility, higher capability to take greater loans, provide banks with enormous opportunity. The East African integration and uh, hopefully um, uh, larger trading blocks, Comesa, SADAC, all coming together, then uh, create a huge marketplace uh, out there uh, for banks. And lastly is globalization and partnerships at a global level gives the banks both a threat uh, of uh, competition from a uh, global bank, but gives them an opportunity of learning and um, creating synergies uh, of collaboration with others. So I would see uh, both uh, playing into the market and it depends on the strategic positioning and uh, strategic preparedness uh, for the bank to deal with both the opportunities and the challenges. It is true that uh, there's been a, a dramatic change uh, in uh, the behavior of the banks. And we have seen the banks becoming what you could call um, responsible citizens uh, and acknowledging that uh, they exist on a public license. And uh, banks seem to have realized that uh, they need to be part and parcel and catalyst of the transformation, that they are privileged and uniquely positioned to be the driver of transformation, as, a, as opposed to uh, adapting to a transformation driven by the others. They have also realized it makes uh, business sense to invest in society to make it a better society as a banking population, helping to really um, I think banks also have come to the realization that while it looks easy to deal with the internal environment, looking at what are my strengths and what are weaknesses, it will be more prudent to deal with the external environment and deal with the opportunities and threats from a market perspective. Um, and that is why you see banks. It is true banks are spending more than a billion. Equity bank is spending on its own more than a billion shillings every year. We'll, in the next uh, one year, we'll be completing a program that we are training a million people on a 11-week uh, financial literacy training program, realizing population coming from peace and trade setup to a fully uh, monetized economy needs to be transited with knowledge on financial literacy. That alone is costing more than uh, at uh, 15 million dollars. Uh, we have opted uh, to educate 10,000 needy but gifted children uh, in society, 25 for every district. Again, realizing that we need to be investing in that population so as to make it more bankable and uh, maybe a better bank. If you look at the uh, transformation of agriculture, equity has set itself and over the last uh, uh, 10 years we have seen we have transformed 460,000 peasant farmers into small scale uh, commercial farmers or agribusinesses. And when you transform them, they become better clients. So it's literally creating the, uh, the client for yourself. So I will not call it uh, uh, social corporate responsibility. I would call it impact investing, uh, social investing, and uh, literally uh, making good business. So I would say uh, doing good uh, makes uh, banks do better.
as equity became successful, we realized there were three areas that we could significantly contribute into. The first one, we saw the challenge of leadership in this country. And when we did a, depth, um, a deep dive on leadership, we realized uh, there was a natural selection method whereby uh, the best positioned uh, at a tender age uh, went to the best school, tended to be uh, to have uh, a head start in becoming uh, the leaders of the next generation. Then we said, okay, what we'll do is to pick the best girl and the best boy in every district. Uh, we are now picking 300 every year. Uh, give them an internship where we coach and mentor them on leadership. Then avail them opportunities to the best uh, university. And over the last uh, three years, we have um, uh, 92 with 14 of them being in Harvard University. Give them the best elite education in the hope that uh, when their time comes to nationally become the leaders, we'll have a very different class of leadership, globally exposed, globally networked, given the best uh, knowledge, and in a critical number that they can, as a generation, uh, choose to change the quality and kind of leadership that we see in this country. This, then we realize suddenly that they are very gifted kids, but from very needy, poor families, orphans, who are never able to transit from the free primary education to, and then we said, why don't we then have a massive program of lifting those ones through the secondary education so that they can also become beneficiaries of the university. And we are located with our partners. We sought partnership from uh, MasterCard Foundation, DFID, USID. Um, we created a program where every district is allocated 25 spaces or 25 scholarships. And today, 10,000 kids, with the majority of them being in the elite schools in this country, the alliances of this world, the Mangus, uh, the Moi girls, hosting those kids. And essentially, we are now seeing those kids are now topping in. So we have given an opportunity where it uh, was um, evasive. Uh, and uh, had. Uh, so what we are seeing is that an opportunity in the future that there will be equal opportunity of a leader to come from the high class, middle class, all the bottom of uh, the pyramid. And when you do it in mass, 10,000, almost every village in the country benefiting to position an advant uh, a gifted but disadvantaged kid, then we are seeing as if we have stirred uh, the society, bridging the gap between the rich and the poor by building opportunities. My background might be a little bit relevant uh, uh, that informed my first experience yeah. in banking. And uh, here I was uh, brought up in a very humble family uh, in a rural area, a beneficiary of what we used to call basales. Uh, coming to Nairobi for the first time when I was coming to Nairobi University and quickly finishing uh, university and uh, uh, given a job by today Ernest and Young and my first assignment was to uh, the bank. Uh, my account at that time for payroll was in post office so I had never had an experience uh, with a bank and then suddenly when I stepped in the bank I'm amazed that uh, it appears uh, I don't fit there, I don't belong there. You look at uh, the people in the bank and you see they are very different from you, from the way they dress, uh, from uh, the flaws of the banking. You know, it was really more of um, a crab sort of mindset uh, that comes. And then suddenly, um, after three years of auditing, I'm pushed by one of the banks. And then I have internal data, and then I saw nobody in my village, nobody in uh, the locality that I was brought in would ever have a bank account. The conditions that had been put, and that was the shock for me. And that is when the opportunity came uh, to lead uh, turn loud at the indigenous bank and make it serve um, the people. And my uh, st benchmark was, can my mother be able to have a bank account? Can the neighbors at home, 
can the boys that we played with when, as we grew up be able to have a bank account? If myself could not have a bank account and I had to be in post office, I wondered whether anybody, and that is where I said, and that inspired me uh, to think about democratizing and making banking relevant to my people. And that is the call uh, that I still answer today. Uh, make banking change lives and livelihoods of our people. Because I have appreciated the power that banks has. If we look uh, at independence, banks allocated resources through credit uh, to those who could, and they set uh, up factories in the industrial area. And since the majority of us as uh, Kenyans were not given resources, we became providers of labor uh, to the same industries. But you can see today, with access to credit of um, the uh, majority of the Kenyans, then you can see industrial area is changing faces. You can see now it's no longer a preserve of some people. And you can see it's not just providing labor, we can now own. We, it's not just about uh, uh, facilitating, but we can create wealth for our own. And, and nation will never develop unless it's able to create uh, wealth for its own people. Uh, my going into the banking was very unique in the sense that uh, while working for an international bank, uh, equity building society that had been started by people from my village uh, was condemned as technically uh, insolvent and requested to cross. And, uh, they, they, um, the only person, uh, the in, those in leadership who knew uh, was very well trained in banking and they said, can you intercede for us? Can you be our change agent? Can you be our, tr our strategist to transform this? Uh, instead of closing, can you come and uh, uh, do a turnaround? Mm -hmm. That was my experience. And the first thing was the shock when I came from an international bank and then I went to a bank that had uh, a building society that had been in existence for 11 years but uh, had built a, a, a loss of 33 million shillings against a capital of uh, 3 million, technically insolvent. Mm -hmm. Deposits was uh, only 21 million shillings, and loans were only 9 million. That was the first shocking news. The fact that they had not done uh, an audit for three years. Uh, so I went into equity emotionally, answering uh, to a request uh, from uh, our friends, yeah. only to be confronted with the stark reality that this was a very tiny, uh, technically insolvent uh, uh, institution. And so my first experience was turn loud, um, change the business model, change the vision, and then train and develop the staff and create a brand. And I'm glad if there is the best decision I ever made, at that time it looked the worst decision uh, because it was uh, like jumping uh, from uh, the, f uh, the furnace to the fire directly. Uh, looking back, I would say it enabled me to serve my community and it ha helped me or turn a whole industry to be relevant to our people. Central bank must come in when, they, there is a, when there is a government because it is a banker of the government. But after that, beyond being a banker of the government, it has to be, it has a core mandate of price stability. But then it also acquires another dimension. It's an agent of development of the market. Now you can see from where we started in 1966 is because the East African uh, currency board collapsed then there was nobody to issue currency. So the Central Bank of Kenya had to start. 
Now it starts by being a banker of the government, then it starts by being uh, the, the distributor of currency, then price stability. Then all of a sudden, since the financial market is growing, it becomes the agent of development as a regulator, both as a regulator and as a market reader. Now, what about the commercial banks themselves? They will find a space when the market is vibrant. In fact, one of the, the, other, the other aspect was it that uh, banks in Africa always come in first of all to take advantage of government securities. And then the other one is to be present in the market. For example, remember in the 1960s, most, most banks were coming in from a colonial point of view so that they are not excluded from the East African community. But once they are there, the market starts developing. Now you can see a, spa a, a, speed, uh, a, a space where the local banks started coming in. It's because they realized that the market requires different actors and different segments to be served. And then that's why you start now seeing the role of the central bank also start changing because of the market vibrancy. But in terms of necessity, market development has to help uh, the institutional development as well as economic development. And that's what we are seeing. But then we have to have a central bank that also evolves with time in terms of the functions, the diversity of the market, and all that. In Kenya, we are lucky because whenever uh, we're the, the banks came in, of course, we separated the financial, uh, other financial uh, sector regulators like CMA, Insurance Regulatory Authority, RBA, Retirement Benefits Authority, and uh, SACOS. It, it, has, uh, it has separated that so that the central bank concentrates very much on the banking. I could say that the effectiveness of monetary policy is the first one. The central bank can always say, have we implemented monetary policy that has coached and coordinated the totality of the economy? I can say, since I joined the central bank, this is six years ago, I have worked very hard on that. That's why everybody talks about the, 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 the central bank rate, CBR. It's a signaling mechanism. So essentially, the market has learned to be coordinated by the central bank rate. It's a signaling mechanism. It creates efficiency in the market. Of course, there are always questions about oh, what does it mean. Central bank and monetary policy is about short-term market rates. It's not about lending rates in the banks because that is determined by other, other factors like, like uh, the, the, for example, the riskiness of the individual going to borrow, the, the kind of project they are going to undertake, and obviously growth momentum is always, they are all intertwined. The second one is that we have created uh, information, uh, this, uh, information sharing, which in, in totality we have created institutions called credit reference bureaus. You know, one of the things that prevents markets from functioning well is when you have information asymmetry. That is, information is partitioned. I cannot tell what you are made of. Yeah. And I have to do a lot of search. Yeah. So information search cost. Now, the, 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 the most important aspect of it is that information allows you, it allows you to develop information capital. Then that can have several dynamics. The first dynamic is that you don't have to have fiscal collateral for you to get a loan in the bank. You can use your credit history. That is your information capital. For me, that was a breakthrough. And working with the KBA to make sure that this project is in, is, is sold, and is functional is very, very important. But this is something that happened during your... your yeah, time. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. No, no, no. I, 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 there, there are some... some yeah, yeah. Is proud of. yeah, some of them start from very far. Yeah. Because essentially, when I came in, microfinance was debated and it was passed. So it, it, since 2002, we had talked about microfinance. Micro, I was coming to the third one, which also covers a, long, a longer span. Microfinance is very important because, first, you have to accept that we are living in a country which has segmented markets. Each segment can be, has to be served by a different instrument. And even those segments of the market are very sensitive to the delivery channels of how you deliver services. That's why microfinance, which, which are both community-based or nationwide, are very, very important. That one is, the debate started all the way back in 1990s. And since, and the bill was passed like 2006, and we had 
to implement it very fast. Since then, we have like eight microfinance institutions. So you can see that that's something that has been coming on. Now, the, f the, the, the fourth one is, um, the, the, I talked about deposit insurance. It started all the way from the discussion in the 80s. But it was in, only in the 90s that we started having, uh, you know, th th there was a seed money put by the Treasury in the World Bank to start the de Deposit Protection Fund. Right now we have surplus funds, we have uh, developed that uh, 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 fund, Deposit Insurance Fund, which covers about 94% of all deposit accounts. And the protected depositors are up to 100,000. Uh, but we have been saying we need to revise it, but that is uh, the dynamics of the market. But you can imagine that if a bank collapses today, and uh, there is no reason to because we have strengthened this position, but if something like that happened, you will be able to pay the de uh, protected depositors with the shortest time. That for us is a stability in the market. That is for us very, very important. No bank should collapse because the regulator has given that effort. You know, one of the things is about the, the, the environment you are operating in. Uh, the second thing is core capital is defined. Core capital allows you to serve a particular niche of your choice, niche market of your choice, with the ability that you have. So the central bank and the government defines the minimum capital. But the maximum or the optimal capital you need is determined by your core capital. What do we look at? We have risk-based supervision to make sure that we can measure or we can look at any system, any vulnerabilities emerging from the market and deal with it. That's why even after the global financial crisis, everybody said we want more regulation. I argued we need better regulation, but not more regulation. Because, because we, we have, in Kenya we have developed a culture of consultative forum. We consult even any regulation that we put into the banks. We cons this consultation, uh, I, I, I liken it with a, a referee, a football match referee. He starts by telling the, the, the players that you know the rules. For me, when I, give, uh, when I blow the whistle and give a penalty kick, I, do, I have not taken sides. I'm enforcing the rules we agreed before the game started. That's the way I tell the bank. So we, everything is consultative. So there is no reason why you could see any form of bank failure. Uh, so that is why. And that is, for us, we also emphasize that better regulation also requires strong institutions. But it's not strong institutions, just the regulator, but also the regulated. Uh, you know, when we raised the core capital to one billion, everybody was complaining. But we said, look at it this way. One billion allows you to rent to how many? Suppose you wanted to roll out a big project, a big housing project, let's say 10 houses. Uh, you can, can you really rent without affecting the ratios? So we have the ratios we deal with. So for me, the most important thing is better regulation. It is going to help us. There are three dimensions to better regulation. One, we can, uh, we can price and analyze risk and price it appropriately. We can check the system's vulnerability. And, and, and three, we can uh, come up with um, the, the incentives all penalties, because we are regulators, that will encourage prudent, prudent behavior in the market. There is what we call uh, Basel Accords. There is Basel 1, Basel 2, Basel 3. They develop as markets develop. Let's, let's give an analogy or an example with a global financial crisis. Why did the global financial crisis happen? Is it because the Federal Reserve Bank was not uh, regulating banks properly? The bottom line is information partitioning because the investment banks are the ones that ignited the problem. But they were not under the control of the Federal Reserve Bank, isn't it? Britain, we had the FSA and Northern Rock problem. It's not that the Bank of England was, had, had failed to supervise banks, but you, the, when the information is partitioned and there is a symmetry of information, then everything goes haywire. So essentially what happens even in the 80s, you remember we had non-bank financial institutions. Then we also had different regulations for non-bank financial institutions and different regulations for commercial banks. Markets are very quick to take any arbitrage gap and use it, isn't it? Even big commercial banks started starting a non-bank financial institution, you remember that. And so it's, it means that you create a problem, an, an, asymmetric, uh, an information symmetric problem. So it's not a, it's not a question of 
uh, not enforcing the regulation is a question is a combination of social political issues but also the economic environment do you know i used to walk all the way from the university to KICC he had come to my bank mm -hmm. and in the process I've passed like five branches of the same bank but if I went in there they could not recognize me. Why are they recognizing me? I haven't changed. It's because they have now a, pro a platform they can use. Rolling out products with different uh, uh, perhaps technological platforms is the one that has helped. Mm -hmm. Secondary, they have found their models like let's say microfinance based. It's working. Third, they have found that they can finance long-term projects, and they are found there in those countries. Those countries, Rwanda, Uganda, have been booming. Mm -hmm. So these are post-conflict economies that are booming after the solution of conflict. And you can see how that expansion has helped the banks. So the banks that are able to compete will find themselves there. Any form of controls creates a rationing mechanism. Be it food uh, prices, or be it uh, in, anything that you impose control creates a rational, a, a rationing device. So essentially, because the market must clear, then it creates a, a capside, a parallel market to clear it. Now, that's, maybe that's too technical, but the most important thing is to say that if you are an exporter and you are exporting coffee, then you export to Europe and you get euros. Do you have an incentive to bring those euros to Kenya when you know that you'll have different difficulties trying to get it out? So that, that incentive, uh, that, that allows you to have an incentive not to declare. So essentially, the, company, the country starts getting less and less of foreign exchange reserves. Similarly, are you going to produce maize if you know that you are, you are going to produce it at a price that is determined by the government? and sometimes your cost of production will be higher. So the, the, then you have an incentive to produce and hold. But because sometimes it can be criminal, then sometimes it's you refuse to produce. So in, in a sense, it creates a disincentive to produce. It creates a disincentive to trade in the market because the prices are controlled. You cannot, you, 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 I cannot export because those proceeds, I will not get them. So it will not be flexible. It allows transfer pricing because then I would rather keep my money out there because I'm flexible with it. So essentially, it means that because of the distortion it creates in the market, we will never come back to it. Now, and you can see those countries that are practicing uh, capital controls or even price controls have not supported production activities. They have not supported commerce because commerce drives when they are just regulations to allow commerce to, to, to thrive, and the central bank sits back to, 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 for, uh, to perform its function of price stability. To controlling prices does not mean that you, you have less inflation. No. In fact, it can be worse because the true price is not what the government is controlling. The true price is how you can <coughs> get goods and services out there in the market, sometimes in formal markets. We have gone through, uh, can we say, we can have gone through stages of uh, economic management. And you can imagine, in those periods, all the countries in this region were exercising price control. The paradigm changed that in the, that's a, you know, remember structural adjustment? Yeah. Structural adjustment um, policies by the World Bank were actually, and, the, and perhaps even the IMF, were actually saying, let the market determine prices and then you are going to see investment flowing in sectors that are profitable okay that's why you you realize if you want to if you want to look at the history you can see that why did we become the fastest uh, and maybe the first uh, cut flower exporter and and there were many investments there so that is the paradigm change from the 70s the 70s was if you control even credit allocation you are going to define the priority sectors but then the market cannot on its, uh, on its own create ge or generate the resources that are required. So it is the thinking that also changed. As you continued with the price control because of scarcity, then it became a distortion. But don't forget that it was a policy that was there at the very beginning. All these countries in, were, were fixing prices. They th the thinking then was that for a young nation, it is going to direct growth in priority sectors. But then over time, the market starts 
uh, seeing that it is a constraint. As foreign exchange dipped, then controls tightened. And we actually argued that the best thing is to let remove the controls and let the market function. Have strong, reg strong institutions regulate the market. That is the, now the change in the, towards the end of the 80s. We changed. You remember even the, f the exchange control, uh, sorry, the, f the, the, exchange, the exchange rate policy changed from a fixed exchange rate to a crawling peg exchange rate. So this, this has been the thinking. But uh, development thinking has, uh, in most countries, uh, changed just because of the necessity. Because essentially, if you wanted to encourage people to produce, then you needed to liberalize prices. But of course, we, we, most of price controls were helping the agricultural sector, for example, food prices. They were having guaranteed prices for the future. You can imagine. So it has its own pitfalls. But the most important thing is that it encouraged the market to grow. There has never been a shortage of currency, but uh, coins, th that is notes, and there has never been a shortage. Just, of course, there has been a complaint about the cleanness of uh, the notes, and we are working on that, because essentially we're also encouraging people to have a wallet, to store money nicely, because you, you can imagine when you have uh, uh, people in the informal sector and the, 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 way they, the, the way they handle the currency, the, the, the complaint has been uh, clean notes. That one we are handling. But coins all over the world ha are always a problem. Because most people tend not to carry coins and they tend to hold them. And we can see the successes we have had when we go into, we had a currency week and we were trying to mobilize people to remove the coins from their cars, from the corners of their bedroom, from their offices, you know. And, and, and we succeeded. We can see the coins are there. We know how much is there. It's, only, it's a question of distribution. And we, have, we are trying to effect or to work out on the distribution mechanism. But we are still getting more coins and issuing more coins. So this is a period where the holding process, you know, most people, you know, we have to encourage people to use coins in the market. Yeah. One of them is creating a deeper market. Deepening the market is, a, is you know, you have several products. You can go, go into a bank and they can give you a solution. Two, you know, the role of banks is actually to create an infrastructure for screening and monitoring borrowers, clients, or even potential borrowers. And they have done that very well, although I would like them to do more. You see, the initial thing, when, when, there, is, when there is risk in the market, what do banks do? Banks invest in government securities, which are risk-free. What happens is that they delegate their screening and monitoring role of new and potential borrowers uh, to the background. That's why, you know, everybody complains in Africa that banks make a lot of profit. It's because they invest in government securities for that are risk-free. Now, what, but our banks have gone out and said, oh, you cannot rely on this every day. You have to compensate other things. So for me, the most important thing is to be receptive about having, you know, coming up and joining up the market. You see, Moving from 1.9 million deposit uh, accounts in 2002 to 17.6 million, it's not the central bank said you must do this. It is them taking advantage of the market. So what I can say is that they have taken advantage and uh, developed the market. The third one is that they have financed projects. And they have even participated in financing long-term long -term projects. Turn anywhere, you see housing projects coming up. You ask yourself, how are they being financed by the, by, the, by, by the commercial banks? Because this is like mortgage finance. They are being financed in uh, like tranches. And for us, we are happy. We are seeing uh, the vibrancy whenever there is economy, when, whenever there is, um, you can look at manufacturing industry and look at how they function in terms of overdraft facilities. You can see. So they have taken up finance. So I'm happy about the banks. But of course, we can do more in terms of uh, uh, going further to reduce the cost of doing business. They have done this at the hostile conditions, but now that conditions are improving, we might want to ask them, hey, how do you bring down cost of doing business? We have participated in bringing cost of doing business down. I started with information sharing. That is one aspect. We have gone into agency banking, so they don't have to create uh, branches all over, even in non-economic areas. Uh, we have gone into, uh, that's agency banking. 
we have gone into allowing them to come up with innovative products that use technological platform like mobile phone financial services. We have created currency centers to take business, to take service to them. They don't have to come all the way to headquarters, congested areas or branches to get their currency. We have created the currency center in Nakuru, in Nyeri, and in Meru. Happily that the KBA is pays for the rent for those places that we are in. We, it's a good partnership, but the beauty of it is that we, it is reducing cost of doing business. So essentially we are happy about that. Of course, the future is that the banks have to do more to also now to reduce the cost of their financial services, given that we have worked so hard with the government to lower the cost of doing business. There are heavy payers. There are heavy uh, revenue payers. That's one aspect. Two, they have pulled the economic, economic growth with them. In 2010, the, 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 the growth in the sector was about 9%, and the economy was grew at 5.6%. When it dipped, the financial system was growing at 7.8%, the economy was growing at 4.4%. Right now, this year, last year, the, economy, the, the, the sector was growing at 10%. And obviously that is going to pull the economy with it. But that is, there has dimensions to it. One is services, the other one is contribution to the revenue, tax revenue. The, gov the, the banks are st among us the top uh, payers of... Uh, they always been like that, remember I'm doing history, have they always been like this? No, it is an evolving, it has evolved. Of course, we didn't also have so many banks yeah. and they didn't have so many customers. You see, it has, it has been an evolution. Now, let's, let's look at if you only had 1.9 million deposit accounts, then your transactions were also small. So as transactions has, has increased because the number of customers reduces unit cost and raises, the, of course, the transactions. So it is the transactions that have increased so that banks, one, they have improved their revenue base, so it means their profits, so it means taxation. So it, it has been something that has occurred over time. They were not like that. Because if they had a, such a small base in terms of operation, customer, and even capital, then of course they were not going to amass, uh, to, to make enough profits. And now we have gone in even, uh, uh, of course, uh, taxing their transactions. And of course you see that. But from a, basic, from a pure uh, income point of view, for example, they have moved from about 5.7 from 2002, 5.7 uh, billion in terms of um, uh, profits to 105 billion in terms of profits. So you can imagine the taxation has also increased with it. So growth in itself brings a lot of positives. So the decades of growth, I have also seen that revenues, tax revenues have increased, profits have increased. It has been the best uh, relationship because so far we have done projects together. We started with currency. Uh, cur uh, uh, currency centers. We went to check truncation together. Then we went to information sharing, uh, if that is credit reference bureaus. And then we also decided to go into the, the, this risk-based uh, consolidated supervision and supervisory colleges together. All this, even revising the rules, the guidelines, we do that together. It's through consultative process, so that when once we say that this is agreed, these are going to be the guidelines, we agree on the timing, and everybody abides. So I think we have made sure that we do everything that uh, we, in, in terms of regulation through consultation with the KBA, okay. and yeah. also and also also even when the monetary policy, I call the the, the, the KBA and the CEOs to come and listen. How wide? What was the basis of the decision of monetary policy? Then, and then we have a survey through the KBA. Of every two months we do a survey in the banks and the non-banks to understand the expectations in the market. You know, the reason why we decided we wanted to be a bank 
we were a microfinance institution and we had grown very big. Um, even though we started with 50 beggars and had not planned at all to grow big, we grow very big because the poor desperately need access to finance for their tiny, tiny businesses that nobody thinks of as a real business. And uh, when the central bank was going to regulate microfinance institutions, I was the vice chair of AMFI, the Association of My Microfinance Institutions, so I was very much involved in these negotiations. We started saying that what they're asking us to do and to be is almost like being a bank, so why don't we become a bank? And we had also seen our members grow from extreme poverty, and some of them grew very fast, and they were now coming into big business. Now they, they were above what we could do in microfinance, and they would have to go to the bank. But the bank they went to then didn't know their history, didn't understand that somebody who had never finished even primary school could be doing such big things. But we understood because we had seen them grow. So we decided we must be a bank ourselves. I had, man I had happened to get to know the poorest of the poor in this country because we adopted a small street kid 25 years ago. And then we got to know his friends, and then we got to know the mothers of his friends. And they were all street beggars. And uh, I was known to be a good fundraiser in those days, but I failed completely to get anyone to give us any money for a project with street beggars. And I was in charge of a pan-African organization at the time. And I couldn't understand, you know, even the government authorities here, even the PC in Nairobi said, Madam, these people are not normal, he said. <laughs> I said, I've come to know them. I find they are very normal. They want the best for their kids and for their lives. So I struggled and struggled, and we managed to start a project in 1995. And when I retired from African Housing Fund, those mothers came to me and said, Mom, you can't abandon us now. What's going to happen to us? So we started what I thought would be a small club of the mothers of my son Baitaka's friends from the time he had been in the streets. And it grew like a bushfire. You know? We had to regulate it. We had to, we grew faster and faster. We realized those who couldn't pay, they had the same problem. They had a patient in hospital. And there's no mother who lets her kid die because he has to, she has a microfinance loan that she has to pay back. So we started a health insurance for our members. And then when they started climbing in more and more businesses and bigger and bigger businesses, we realized they need training. So we started our own business school. And that's how Jamie Bora has acted all the time. As we saw a problem, we never said, this is impossible. We always said, everything is possible. And we started something to help them. Now, when the central bank discussed how to regulate microfinance institutions, we felt uh, that uh, by that time we were very big and we were all over the country, we felt uh, there's not much difference between being a bank and being a regulated microfinance institution, so why don't we become a bank? Because now some of our members had climbed so high, they needed really big loans, you know, and they were running big businesses even though they have started like the smallest of the small. I think we had a mission, yeah. and still has yeah. a mission, that we want to show the world that poor people can also make it. And they're not poor people because they're bad people, they're poor people because they didn't have the options. And banks, when they talk about reaching the poor, they are not talking about the very, very, very poor. Now, when we became a bank now, and had decided that we would rather be a bank than a regulated microfinance institution, what we had to do, because Central Bank would not approve a, a microfinance institution to become a bank, their whole problem was that they had too many banks, and too many were very small and couldn't make it. So, as we have always done in Jamibora, we have always said, Nothing is impossible. So what we did, we bought a small bank. 
the smallest bank in Kenya was called City Finance Bank, and it only had one branch and I think about five staff, and it should have been closed a long time ago. But we bought that bank, and we became majority shareholders then immediately by taking over, and that became Jamibora Bank. That we have the microfinance, we also have uh, you know, the, the people who have come into businesses that are on the way up. And that's a very big group in Kenya. And then uh, anyone can join our bank. So we are a normal bank now. In fact, one of the problems we had was that the central bank rules are tougher than we thought from the beginning. We had 105 branches in Kenya from Moyale in the north to Taveta in the south, from the coast to the border of Uganda, in all corners of the country. But with the rules of Central Bank, they could not approve those 105 places as, as real branches. So we had to close a lot of branches. And that was very painful. And then the people came and said, what about us? Mom, have you abandoned us? And then what happened? Yeah, we decided, as we always do, we see a challenge, we do something about it. So we formed a, um, a cooperative society, ASACO, to assist the members that could not be served by the bank. And you see, they continue growing now and then they can become bank um, customers. So now it's like a, a breeding place, if you want. And our bank is growing very fast. So we will eventually be in all those places with our bank, but until we can be in all those places. We have the Sako. And Jamibora, the name that we choose when we started Jamibora was also brilliant. We wanted to call ourselves to mine uh, trust. We, we, we formed a charitable trust in the late 90s. But there was already a trust called to mine trust, you see. Yeah. So we had to come up with another name. And I sat with a few of the beggars in my garden at home and we were talking and one of them said you know mom you're the only one who understands that we are also good families we are also good people we love our children and we want the best for them and that's what it clicked in my head I said of course you are why don't we call ourselves that so that's how the name Jamibora came up and, and it has been a brilliant name When I first came to Kenya in 1985, and I was heading a UN program of housing for the very poor, which was a global program, the kind of misery I saw all over the world when I was around, I can't believe it, people living in caves, people living in the garbage dumps, everywhere in the world. And I'm an architect and urban planner by profession, but most people think I'm a social worker, and I'm proud of that. <laughs> but I, I said to myself, this is unbelievable. And Swedish housing problems looked very small to me once after what I had seen. So when I discussed with the, my newfound friends in various African governments and institutions, uh, and Africa was sort of waking up. You know, in Asia and Latin America, they had already not seen the drama of big cities and huge slums. But Africa was still rather rural. And, and the slums were there, and the government officers, they would close their eyes like this. I don't see this. And in some countries, they were even chased away, you know, out in the bush. And the, the more we saw that, we said, we have to do something about it can't be right that people live like this. And then uh, several of my newfound friends in various African governments, they said, we have decided we want to start a pan-African intergovernmental organization to deal with housing for the poor and sort of start projects and inspire the governments and make them see we can actually make it, we can do it. And then they wanted me to come and head that program so I promised to stay for a year because I thought they should have an African as a head of an African, pan-African organization. But I was actually there for 11 years. And then the governments 
now took over, each one took over their own program. And now everybody knew we can actually make it it's possible for poor people to have better housing and afford it. We continued in a small way in uh, Jami Bora, but it's, uh, as we grow, the members were saying, and what about housing, mom? Are we not going to do anything about housing? So we also started our own housing program. Um, I think the association was actually set up in 1962 mm. and then it was called the Kenya Bankers Employers Association mm. and as the name implied it was um, uh, because the industry was growing and the employers as bankers as employers felt that there was a need to bring the employers together and handle at that point in time the industrial relations that they needed to handle collectively. So initially, the association mainly handled the collective bargaining agreement with negotiating the CBA with the, with the unions on behalf of the employer, which then was collectively doing it together under the umbrella of the Kenya Bankers Employers Association. I think the employer felt that um, whereas the union was uh, picking up strength, they also needed as employers to have strength in terms of uh, working together. So they wanted to have an umbrella body through which they could relate with the union because the union at that point in time was working together as a union mm -hmm. and on the other side from their end they were more or less like single employers. Mm -hmm. So they needed to work together as a union so that they can be able to interact with the union as two bodies mm -hmm. of equal strength. I think the critical thing over there was the fact that um, uh, now the employer as, as, uh, as, an, as, a, as a body had one common entity that could resolve the issue. And so now they were having a body through which they could have the collective bargaining agreement. And really from that point in time, the employer's body was mainly uh, handling the collective bargaining agreement on behalf of the employer with the union. Since then, I think the next one was, um, which did not, um, uh, uh, you know, extend for a, for a period, was in 1998. You recall there had been a strike really out of um, something that was not an error on the part of the banks as an employer. I think the, they had, the, the government then had stressed on the need for uh, fringe benefits tax to, to go through. And so the, employ the employees felt aggrieved. Yeah. And out of that, there was a strike. Yeah. But you remember at the same time, incidentally, there was the bomb blast. Yeah. Yeah. Now we had another common problem, yeah. and it was now difficult for the employees to continue striking about this grievance when we all as a nation are faced with the, with, with the more serious problem. And so the strike in a way fizzled out, and the employers got, employees got back to work. Now, the central bank, actually what we have seen is over time, um, um, uh, the relationship between the bankers association and, uh, and the central bank has become more of a partnership. Um, even though the central bank still has got the regulatory responsibility over the members and the bankers association is the representative body of the members, but the relationship between central bank and the Kenya bank association over time has more or less become a partnership, which is a unique kind of relationship. I've seen in other markets, we almost like would do not have a similar kind of partnership kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. And why am I saying is almost a partnership? We have implemented quite a number of projects for the betterment of the industry in partnership with Central Bank. I can give an example like the check truncation uh, system. Uh, we own the clearing house, and so um, yet Central Bank has got a mandate over the national payment system. So the clearing house is a major component of the national payment system. So in order for us to modernize the clearing house, 
which is a major component of the clearing uh, the national payment system, we had to work with Central Bank in partnership. The clearing house is really um, the, 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 the house, the physical house, where the banks come to exchange the, the clearing effects. And by clearing effects, we mean the checks. So like, for example, if you draw a check and you bank it into your, you deposit your check into the bank, the bank will get that check and bring it to their clearing center which is a central place where all the branches bring their checks for each bank into Nairobi. Mm. Now then those checks are sorted out and they are taken to the clearing house. Now the clearing house is where all the clearing agents from all the banks come to meet and they exchange the banks. So you have checks that have been deposited in your bank mm. and you exchange them with the other bank which will also give you the checks that have been drawn on you but deposited at their bank. So at, that's a medium through which you exchange the checks. Now, then you go back with the checks and you decide on which ones you're going to pay and which ones you're not going to pay and you return them within a given period of, of time. Yeah. So now then the other bank will, after the period has expired, it will then credit the amount to the check that was deposited in the bank. That is physically how the clearinghouse works. Now, by the check truncation system, what you have done is that you have converted that manual process of the checks moving from where they are deposited to the clearing center, to the clearing house, and then back, in case they bounce, back to the original bank and then back to the customer. We have now automated all that process and, 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 and made it electronic. So now, rather than the physical checks flowing, we take an image of the check and then it flows through the system and then back. What that has achieved is two. Uh, the, the process is faster, because electronic, so we are now able to clear the checks from the original 21 days, by the way, in the, in the early 90s, to now just about two days. And in fact, we intend to go to zero days, same day clearing, eventually. Then the other thing is, uh, th by making this process electronic, we have eliminated fraud. Because you see, along the line, because of the manual processing, you could get checks substituted yeah. or checks amended manually yeah. through the process. But now because electronic, all that is not possible. Yeah. So you have made the clearing process much safer and much faster and more efficient. Yeah. It's not the system. Most of the places in the world, actually, the clearing house is owned by uh, Central Bank yeah. or run by the Central Bank. And um, uh, members come in as participating agencies. Yeah. Now, in Kenya, we have always owned the clearing house. And um, uh, because the clearing house really is a forum through which the members come to exchange the, the, the checks. And Central Bank is also a participant yeah. because it's the bank for the, for the government. Yeah. So it comes in as a participant and also clears the checks yeah. against, you know, against the other members. Yeah. But having said that, Central Bank also provides an inspector yeah. for the clearing house. Because, as I mentioned earlier, Central Bank has got a mandate over the national payment system in the country and the clearing house being a key component of the national payment system, they have got to take a keen interest on it and therefore they provide a, an inspector for the house um, to, to help us um, run the, the clearing house. I think one of the things is uh, one of our key roles as, uh, as an entity, we have mentioned the industrial relations which has been there and uh, we still continue doing, but our role has sort of like expanded and we see ourselves moving more into the advocacy uh, arena where we try to proactively influence policy uh, formulation uh, process. And so we engage the stakeholders in the policy formulation um, arena. And that's where our engagement with the parliamentarians, for example, comes in. Our engagement with the Treasury, uh, because we submit, for example, to the Treasury proposals of um, policy proposals that we intend to see in the budget as the budget is being formulated. And that we do um, every year. And some proposals we do make forth and defend at the budget committee level eventually end up in the, in the proposal. Not all, but a number of them would end up in the budget proposal uh, document. Now, 
Um, in terms of engaging the other parliamentarians, for example, you, you may recall um, uh, for the last almost one and a half years, there was the debate about legislating the interest rates. And there were arguments for and against. And uh, we thought that it was a responsibility as an industry to enlighten or give our views to the parliamentarians who are in the process of trying to propose a legislation that we thought will have significant effects on the whole operation of the banking industry. So we had to give our side of, um, of, 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 of the story and we engaged them quite, uh, quite, 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 quite um, uh, aggressively because we had several meetings with the parliamentarians, different parliamentary committees. Uh, we were summoned to various uh, sessions of uh, the parliamentary committee briefings and uh, eventually I think our view was, was heard. It's more or less um, 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 an association that tries to serve the best interests of the members. But of course we have got uh, the members on one side, we have got our consumers with the banking public on the other side, you have got the other stakeholders, which is the regulator, we have got the parliamentarians, and we have got to ensure that the interests of all these parties are well served through the umbrella association. We do not have the powers to punish because, um, as, as we said, you know, we are an association of the members. So there is a regulator who has got enormous powers to punish. But uh, and then we have got the association, which more or less try to act in the best interest of the members. Yeah. There is a mechanism um, because you see one of the biggest punishments that you can get, even in a family, is to actually to be, you know, um, to be expelled yeah. by your fellow family members. And normally that's a bigger punishment than actually yeah. being jailed. <laughs> so I like the punishment from from the central bank, for example, to being some, you know. Um, some criminal justice, but the punishment by the association as being a family kind of punishment within a family setup. And you get that um, we have got rules, and in the worst case possible, we can actually expel a member. And the other thing is that, you know, we own and run the clearing house. Now, the possibility of being expelled out of the clearing house is so painful to a member that you would rather not go that route. And we have never come to a point where we have actually threatened to expel a member, but that is the worst case scenario that we will have to fall back to. And I, I think, by and large, members try to uh, ensure that you do not do something that will alienate yourself from the rest of the membership. The kind of um, uh, changes that we have tried to bring up within the, within the KBA to be able to play our role that is widening now from the traditional role of uh, collective bargaining agreement to include advocacy and uh, also the management of the clearing house. Uh, we have had to um, uh, bring in capacity within the KBA to be able to handle that. And one of the things was that for the advocacy role to be effective, it needs to be backed up by a strong research base. And uh, in, in, order, in order to assist that, you have set up within the KBA a center, which you're calling the KBA Center for Research on Financial Markets and Policy. And this center is coming up with the research findings that are, that are informing our advocacy initiatives. And that, that, in a way, has been found to be very effective because when you are giving an advocacy position from an informed base well founded by research, you are much better able to defend the position and justify the position than when it's just uh, based on you know, um, um, you know, information that is not well founded because it's then easy to be challenged. But when you have got a well founded research, then it's much easier to defend your position and you basically advocate for a much more well-founded position. It's a proactive kind of yeah, thing. Right. Like we had, we had the, the KBA Research Conference, which we are now having an annual, um, an annual uh, event on. Um, uh, and we pick on topics that are of interest in the market. And uh, researchers from all over, including foreign institutions, they actually come in and uh, 
carry out research on specific topics and that informs the position that you can advocate, for example, to the parliamentary uh, committees. Sometimes we, we, we generate positions that we then say that, you know, we should steer this discussion along this direction or we should steer this legislation along this direction based on what we have um, from the research findings. I, I think one of the one of the um, um, areas that you will not fail to notice um, uh, within um, uh, as as attributable to the KBA is the evolution of the clearing system. Um, um, uh, initially, it was a manual clearing system, and the mere fact that um, uh, we were then able to bring in the check truncation process and convert the manual processing into an electronic processing and therefore achieve a more efficient and a more secure clearing platform. I think that's one milestone. And this is a project that was implemented in partnership between the KBA and the CBK. That's, that's one. And then the other one is um, uh, what you call the CRB, the, Czech, the, the Credit Reference Bureau, which is um, a project that is being implemented again by the KBA. And um, it's... it's, it's um, a case where now we are able to um, appraise a client on the basis of the information unique to the client rather than relying on, um, on a gut feel, for example. And um, so by developing this mechanism where the information about an individual is collected and, um, and um, we can then be able to get a credit report on the individual and the individual can use that report to be able to negotiate for better terms in terms of either collateral or in terms of the interest rate that you can negotiate with the bank, I think for us that's, that's a major milestone where the benefit would be accruing to the individuals and the individual can then be able to differentiate himself. When he's a good borrower, he gets the benefit for it. And when he's a bad borrower, he's actually the one who bears the cost rather than spreading it across to everybody. I think one of the things that come to mind normally when you when you talk about the economic challenges is um, the, the the usual comparison uh, in terms of uh, the cost of credit, because um, um, uh, somebody will normally say that I'm able to get a loan, for example, in the U.S. at uh, three four percent. How come in Kenya I cannot get anything below seventeen percent or below fifteen percent? And normally that difference is what um, 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 quite a number of uh, people cannot understand. And so as, as, uh, as, as KBA, what you have tried to do is to, to educate or to get the information out there on why that kind of a difference can actually exist. It's not that the Kenyan banks are overcharging you or anything, but it's just that um, the, the economic reality in the two economies are, are different. And um, so we try to uh, expound on, um, on, on, um, on, on why such a difference would occur. And really, when you look at um, uh, uh, the reality, is that in terms of arriving at the price of credit um, in, in Kenya, there are a number of factors that come in. One of them is the cost of funds for the banks. The other one is the operational overhead that the banks have got to incur. Then the third one is the, the credit risk uh, margin that the banks um, uh, have got to uh, load on in view of the fact that when that money leaves the bank, it may never come back. So the probability that that money may not come back translates into a risk, and that's the risk that you load onto the cost of funds to, to unlend the funds to the, to the consumer. Now, those various components are determined by different drivers. And so it's, it's our duty now to let the consumer know the interplay between those variables in arriving at the cost of credit. When I mentioned about the operational overheads, um, we have got things like, for example, the cost of infra the infrastructure challenges that we have. We have got things like, for example, the cost of, um, uh, of cost of employment in the banking industry. And you remember I mentioned the fact that we normally have the collective bargaining agreement negotiated with the union. And so our responsibility is to, to ensure that that cost is maintained within, within control, yeah. not to you know, blow out of proportion. Then you have got challenges like, for example, um, uh, we have got backlog of cases 
at the judiciary, which translate into costs of operation for the banks. And if we can work closely, and indeed we are, with the, with the judiciary, to try to clear off some of those backlog of cases, then the, effectively the cost of operations for the banks will also effectively come down. At the land registry, there is a huge problem in there in that um, uh, sometimes to charge a security, it could take more than a year. Meanwhile, you've got a customer who has got an immediate need. Now you've got to make a decision. Do I release the money pending registration of the security, which may never be registered, or do I wait until my security is registered before I release the money? Either way, it's a huge decision which is costly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a challenge and what we need to do now is to work around that to ensure that um, those challenges are, are, are removed and uh, the operational overhead for the bank is, 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 is effectively reduced which then will translate into lower costs of, um, of, of borrowing. The other one of course we mentioned is the credit risk. Mm -hmm. Credit risk is you know, the probability that when you lend out that money it will never, it will never come back and how we working to ensure that the credit risk is reduced in the market. I mentioned about the credit information sharing initiative, the CRB mechanism, where we'll have now specific information about a borrower. Yeah. Then we are able to assess that borrower based on his own profile. Yeah. And then we credit, we price the risk appropriately, rather than assuming that this person, because he's, for example, a teacher, and I know that teachers have got specific characteristics, yeah. and I assess you on the basis of what I know about teachers rather than you as an individual person. Yeah. And effectively, if you're a good borrower, if you've got a good track record, then you're able to enjoy a better, better terms yeah. than it will otherwise apply to the rest of the market. Yeah. And the other good thing is that um, uh, the small percentage, about 5% of the borrowers are the bad ones. Now, I can be able to identify those 5%. Not that I'll not give them money, but I can price them appropriately. And they bear the cost of their non-performance. And then you, the good borrower, can enjoy the benefits of your good performance. I think I'll look at them as, uh, the, the main challenges I can, I'll look at them as twofold. One is uh, there's a huge proportion of Kenyans out there who either are unbanked completely or they are underbanked. So from the statistics available, we are just about, I think in 2009, this, the, the data was that just about 30% of Kenyans were banked. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge proportion of Kenyans out there who don't have access to banks or are uh, in, uh, inadequately accessed. Yeah. So they don't have all what they require from the banking system. And our challenge, I think, as an industry will be to access our services to those uh, Kenyans who do not have access. The other challenge is the cost of uh, those services. Um, th there has been, um, an, I would say there has been more or less like an outcry of the fact that the cost of the banking services, and maybe not just banking services, but I'll say financial services, is too high for the consumer. And so we have got that twin challenge, access our services to the person who is not currently being accessed and bring the cost of those services down. And I see the role of technology coming in very strongly in this, um, uh, in this twin challenge, both in terms of getting our services to the consumer and bringing the cost of those banking services down. Um, if you look at the, um, the, um, the, the accessing the consumer, we already have mobile banking, which is the interplay now between the mobile telephony and the banking services. And even though initially the uptick of, um, of uh, mobile technology was not quite um, 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 uh, as popular within the banking industry. I think over time, banks have realized that um, the, 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 there can be this um, leveraging on each other between the mobile telephony and uh, the, the banking platform to be able to access the customers who are already having the telephone, uh, mobile telephone um, access 
and get your services through this mechanism to the actual consumer. So you see the telephone, mobile telephone, as a distribution channel yeah. rather than as a competitor for your services. Yeah. And I think once that message is starts going, getting through, we are seeing a lot more innovations coming in along that platform. And I can mention one example, the Mshuari uh, product, which is a recent innovation that two entities, one a bank and one a mobile phone uh, company, have come together and unleashed a product out in the market that is picking up quite well. We are only accessing about 30% of, of the market. So the microfinance institutions and the circles are actually accessing a market that banks were not able to access even initially. So in a way they are also um, helping in the financial inclusion agenda, yeah. where the, 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 in the community or the members of the Kenyan, um, Kenyan um, population that could not access banking services yeah. are now able to access the financial services through the microfinance institutions yeah. and the circles. Um, uh, you can imagine somebody who could not um, 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 have a bank account because either the, either the minimum deposit required is, uh, is too high or the distance to the, to the branch is, 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 too, is too long, now is able to access those services much nearer his place of work or his place of uh, abode, um, uh, either through the circles or through the microfinance institutions. I think what tends to happen is that um, as, as a microfinance institution develops and then it becomes a deposit-taking microfinance institution mm -hmm. and then it gets licensed by the central bank because mm -hmm. um, um, from the microfinance uh, institution, when you become deposit-taking, you're then licensed by the central bank. Mm -hmm. And so the regulatory environment that you're facing is similar to what the banks face. Mm -hmm. And so your operations start becoming like a bank. And some of them now find it easy to start up scaling. So even in terms of their clientele, you have got the basic original microfinance client that you had, but then you start upscaling up to maybe start serving the SME. Yeah. So in your corporate clientele, you have got the SME clientele. And slowly as you upgrade and you start picking up bigger tickets yeah. within the SME area, you start encroaching yeah. into what initially was being served by the banks. Because the banks are also, rather than just serving the big corporates, they are also scaling down to start serving also the microfinance, the, um, the SME sector that requires smaller tickets. Mm -hmm. And so over time you see that there's that overlap. And that overlap means that um, the microfinance entities start encroaching into the areas where initially only banks would go. But also because the banks are seeing an opportunity in the areas where they have not been, they are also downscaling. So there is that overlap, and I think that overlap is good because then the consumer there is the one who benefits. He can either go for the bank or he can go for the, for the microfinance entity, or as the microfinance entity converts its operations into almost like a bank, for the customer there is no difference between an original bank and a former microfinance that has become a bank. We have seen um, uh, the debate picking up in terms of uh, having stronger, uh, um, a stronger banking industry. Yeah. And by a stronger banking industry, it means that the capitalization going up. And one of the ways of forcing uh, um, the, the mergers and acquisitions so that you have got stronger banks is just overnight to increase the minimum core deposit for yeah. the, the minimum core capital that the banks require. And that increase will then force banks to consolidate. Yeah. Right. But there's a bit of reality that you need to bring in. Yeah. Currently, if, say, for example, you increase the minimum capital from 1 billion, which it is today, to, say, 2 billion, yeah. you possibly may get one or two banks having to consolidate yeah. to be able to hit the 2 yeah. billion, but all the others would be already above that. Yeah. So you will reduce the banks from the current 43 42. You will not have achieved much. And now when you increase it from, say, 1 billion to 5 billion, again, you might have about five banks that may have to, to, to consolidate. So again, you find that you might not have achieved much. It needs to be some very drastic move, say, from 1 billion to 10 billion. And there must be a good reason for you to have the 10 billion requirement. And I think if it's just the issue of adequate capitalization, 
there is even an argument that the capital should be reduced so that banks can now be able to serve the regional markets that are developing so that a bank can focus on a particular county yeah. and serve that county and serve it well. Yeah. Now, so there are those, you know, developing arguments and whichever way, but I think at the end of the day, we need strong capitalized banks that can be able to withstand any external shocks that may hit the market. And uh, so it will be incumbent upon the regulator to assess and see at what level should we be increasing the minimum capital required for purposes of adequacy of the capital base rather than for the sake of having the banks consolidated. We have got commercial banks that have come and set um, their, a base in Kenya. And I think most of them are not looking at Kenya as a market. They are looking at the ESC as a market. So most of them have come into the market with the wider perspective of the ESC, but possibly having a base in Kenya. But they are looking not at Kenya as a market, but as the regional market. And for this, we can talk of the likes of Ecobank, which is a West African bank that has set up here. We have got a UBA Bank, which is a West African bank, again, that has set up here. And they are setting up from a regional context. Um, and, and that is bound to continue. And, and in a way, that shows that um, uh, as a region, we have become an, an attractive um, investment horizon, um, um, not just for Kenya, but for, for the region. But having said that, we are also seeing another trend. When you talk about foreign banks, we are now got about seven uh, foreign banks that have been licensed as representative offices in Kenya, yeah. which means that these banks are seeing some, some, some attraction of uh, the, even given the fact that um, Kenya is developing as a regional financial hub and they are seeing Kenya as a good entry point into that market to tap into the opportunities that they are. There are huge infrastructure projects that will be coming up, especially with where Kenya is and where the region is. And it will need serious players and they are seeing that as an opportunity and so they are already coming to position themselves to take advantage of those uh, opportunities and based on how they develop their portfolio they will then be able to decide on whether they want to now have a fully fledged bank in the region or, uh, or, or not. As an industry we are proud of that because um, one is that the Kenyan banks that are spreading into the, um, into, into the region are more or less are, are our ambassadors. They are spreading our, um, our good banking practices into, in, into the region. And you've seen quite a number of Kenyan banks, um, and in, in fact some banks are in all the five ESC markets, uh, ESC member countries, including South Sudan. Um, um, and uh, all, if you look at most of the Kenyan banks currently, the strategic plans, most of them have got the idea of going regional or um, tapping into the regional markets. Either in the medium term or in the long term plan, they'll have it somewhere because they are seeing those opportunities in that um, uh, Kenya as a market has got the right um, um, uh, practices and the right uh, structures to be able to exploit the markets that are opening up within the ESC region. We started this journey of, of cataloging the history of banking in Kenya um, last year in conjunction with the 50th anniversary of Kenya Bankers Association. And also, it so happened to be the same time in the opening um, process or the starting process, really, of um, the country's Jubilee celebration. So it was just perfect timing. We're celebrating KBS 50th anniversary. Kenya is about to celebrate its uh, Jubilee year. And uh, we partnered with uh, the renowned um, biographer Hilary Nguyeno, who's known very well for all the historic uh, documentaries that he's done uh, to, to catalog uh, the banking industry's history. And it has taken us a year 
it has been quite a process of uh, triumphs and upsets, triumphs and finding this rich culture and this rich history in the archives. Um, the support we've gotten from various partners, including uh, Kenya Railway and the National Archive, the various media houses, the various banks, um, those were the triumphs. But there were also the upsets in that um, some of the history got lost. For example, uh, one of the banks, one of the older banks that have been here for over 100 years lost all their archive material. So it, it's it's quite sad. It was a sad moment for us, but we we, 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 we pushed on and were able to, I think, do a decent job in, in telling the history. I think where we were challenged with Hillary was on patience because uh, you, you, you realize we thought we would finish this project in three months and that was, we started, we first met in, in May uh, I think we, we did our brainstorming session on what themes we wanted to cover for the documentary. So we, 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 we did the themes, um, Africanization of banking, uh, the pre-independence, um, what technology has done in banking. Diversity was a key area that I thought was important for us to catalog as well. So we did the themes and then uh, we identified the people we wanted to interview. And we just assumed that everything would fall into place within three months and six months turned into nine months turned into 20 you know not 24 months but 12 months and we're still at it so I think the biggest challenge was our patience our patience and, and making sure that we we were able to get the content that we needed in in time I've learned so much from this process so much about our, our, our culture as a people so much about the country's history. I think what was most powerful for me is it just kind of reinforced the fact that the history of banking and the history of Kenya is interconnected. And and so often uh, I think uh, banking gets a really negative uh, rap, a bad rap, bad reputation for, for some of the things that we probably could do better. But what we sometimes fail to realize is banking does so much for economy, for society, and, and, and you'll see it through this documentary. You'll see that um, the, the East Africa Protectorate was able to grow uh, into the mainland because they partnered with National Bank of India. You'll see that through government-owned banks, um, the, 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 the workforce, the professional workforce in this country incorporated more Kenyans, more, more blacks. Um, and, and Barclays was the first bank to hire a branch manager, a woman, a woman as a branch manager. So banking was a pioneer and a vanguard, really, in so many things that have transformed this nation sustainably. And, and to me, that was the most powerful, powerful thing uh, that, that uh, I got to, to experience and learn uh, throughout the process. My favorite interview was with Dr. Elkelo. Um, because I was just humbled. I remember I, I visited her to, to ask her to participate in, in this documentary. And when you walk into her office, you see all these global awards that she has received. But meanwhile, she has a very small desk, like a teacher, you know, because she's still the director of McKinney Schools and she still reports to work every day. And um, you walk in and you see all these global awards and she's sitting there as humble as can be and she tells me how she and her colleagues paved the way for women like me in banking. Um, it was through their efforts and their sacrifice um, that they were able to break that glass ceiling for the first time ever. And, and, and I learned so much and I was inspired so much. So I think, I hope that all the young ladies who watch this documentary uh, will also be empowered and inspired about where they can take their careers. Um, actually, Hillary surprised me because we were expecting him to, uh, to, to, to walk with us until the end. We started this journey a year ago and uh, I thought we would be running and, and crossing that finish line together, but he's such a humble man. And that surprised me, that he's quite humble 
and he's quite he's quite reserved and he is not doing this for the glory you would think that he's a producer that wants to get the notoriety and that wants to be out there and you know rubbing shoulders with the bank CEOs to say what he was able to do for the industry but this is a man who um, that, that's not what drives him and I think that surprised me I, I think I expected it but I didn't expect him to be that principled in not not being part of the launch which is quite sad Final thoughts, um, I think um, it's been an honor to work with Hillary. Um, this is something that is, 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 is going to go into the archives and it's going to outlive um, all of us and I'm just humbled to be part of the process. Uh, I know this is a documentary that's coming out at a time where Nelson Mandela is fighting for his life in South Africa. Um, he's also another icon who has shaped history, African history, um, and you can imagine his work will live on. So this is one of, the, and he always said that uh, to, to, to really make a difference in this world, you have to make sure that you make a difference in people's lives and that difference lives on. So I think I'm humbled to be part of this process because I hope that the work that we've spent doing for the past year lives on and, and makes a difference.